I gotta find the volume. We are live. Another edition of Thursday is coming your way. I'm Beto Duran, and Roberto's trying to figure out the volume. He's trying to figure everything out. Joel Diaz is ready. Roberto's ready. Roberto, can you hear us? I can hear you guys <laughs> loud and clear. Let's party. Let's do this. Well, it, 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 desde cuando que estás en el show? We forgot about us. I know, I know, I know. I'm sorry, I'm sorry. There was some hard time. There was a little couple rocks on the road, and uh, se me metieron al zapato, and they were throwing it up my butt. <laughs> no decir lo peor. Well, you know what, Roberto? The time you were gone, uh, we created a monster. <laughs> sorry. Ya ves, son ustedes, son los culpables. I he called me that. today. He called me today and he said, Hey, you feeling a little sick? <laughs> <laughs> and I'm like, What are you talking about? If, if you need me to, like, you know, come on in last minute, I, c I can relieve pitch relief or whatever, right? I could be the relief pitcher. And I'm yeah. Like, no, 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 tranquilo, cabrón. Hoy me toca. Yeah, you're talking about, uh, uh, of course, uh, Javier Razo, friend of the show, uh, ready to go. And you're right, he played golf today. And, coach, you won't believe this. Today, Tugayo Razo. Uh, 10 minutes ago texted me, hey, can you, um, can you, uh, what's the word, uh, delay the show because I need to take a shower. I'm like, what do you mean take a shower? He's like, well, I want to see the whole show, so why don't you guys delay it for me? So Raza will be here in about 15 minutes. I'm like, you got to be kidding me. You're telling us how to do our show. I, our show. You're telling us how to do it. And he did not really understand that, no, we're not going to do that. So, uh, Razo, he'll join us eventually. Maybe if he doesn't, whatever, we're going to have a good time tonight. Uh, because the return of Roberto Diaz, the most interesting man in the world. Thanks to everybody who's always uh, being involved. Uh, of course, let's, let's shout out to everybody. Daniel Ochoa and his family. Uh, Eddie Aguilera, uh, Aguilera Boxing Champions, does a great job with the trunks. Said, I would hate to tell Roberto, hey, let me buy you the first drink. You can't buy Roberto the first drink. Because Eddie, it's intimidating. It's intimidating. <laughs> Eddie, Eddie, you can buy the first. Let me buy the last. <laughs> there it is. Uh, well, I always start with micheladas if it's early, so it's cool. Michelada would be good. Michelada starts early, yeah. I had actually, the, the, that happened to me one time, one of my first fights in Vegas. I was like, hey, what's everybody drinking? You know, I felt good. I was going to get my first Golden Boy check. Oh, you know, Razo. Pineapple, tequila, all right, cool. The Julio pineapple, whatever. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. 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 Everybody, blue label, blue label. Yeah, but, uh, <laughs> the, no, 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 he was, no, no, regular pineapple. Then Roberto Diaz. Oh, is, that's why when you came to me, I think it was blue label. Yes, it was blue label. I'm like, <laughs> I, 2014, I didn't know what blue label was. Hey, I I learned that uh, the per diem went quick that night, and we're, but, it, <laughs> but it was worth it. But it was worth it. It was worth it. So thanks to everybody joining us. As always, we have a lot of fun. Roberto's back. Joel's back. And we're going to get going with the show. As always, we start off with, uh, look, look, we see Roberto has his uh, cigarro. He's ready to go. Bobby, what do you have to sip on tonight? Tonight, I opened up a little bottle of wine. It's a oh. uh, French Bordeaux. Uh, which is one of my favorites. Yeah, it's not from the coast. It's from the coast. This Estornel family. Woof. Uh, w one of the pictures I put up uh, a few weeks ago, because I knew it was come back. I'm yeah. back at uh, Thursdays. There you go. We miss you, Bobby. Cheers to you, Joel. ¿Qué tiene usted? Well, uh, they delivered a bottle. Aye. I'm gonna try it out. Señor de los wow. Hey. <laughs> that's a. Uh, that's a uh, Agus. Yes. So, I got Señor de los Cielos tequila today. It's uh, it's really really good. So it's very good. There you go. I'm mixing I'm mixing it up with a little bit of uh, Golden Boy pineapple coconut water today. You're the only one that has that water. You're the only one. I don't know why. <laughs> it is good. It is good. I mean, it's because Razo don't like it, oh. so they don't give it to Razo. Exactly. There it is. Well, cheers so to you, having, coach. I'm, I'm having a, a smooth drink tonight. Yeah, and, and come on. how hot is it in India right now? Mm. Actually, it's it's uh it's cooling down. It's not as bad as it was a few days ago. A few days ago, it was hot, humid. Actually, this morning, I woke up really early and I went out to, to the I went out to, to the building, and uh, I, I got a nice fresh breeze. It was comfortable working in the morning out there. Actually, they're working outside. I got the shovel, working with the shovel because uh, they're gonna do two handicap parkings with a sidewalk all the way to the front so it was comfortable this morning it got a little got a little hot during the day 106 107 but it got, 
<laughs> it's just a little hot. <laughs> yeah, I remember though, for us, for us, hot is 116, 118. 105, hey. 106 is beautiful. What the? I saw, I saw pictures, okay? Or video, something I saw today. And he has two major fans, like, hitting them while they're working. Imagine it's 105 or 106, but they're working under the sun with the palas and moving. That's like 115 anywhere else in the world. Ah, uh, so, Coach, I just looked. And that fan probably feels hot. Yeah, I just looked at my phone right now. It says, right now, 8.07 p.m. in Indio, 102. It's fresh for us. I'll tell you, it's fresh right now. I just, hey, look, I just, I, I just, I just left the building like, like 35 minutes ago. And I was out there just to see the, the improvement of the, of the, of the cement they're going to pour. And actually I stopped and it was fresh. It was nice. Yeah. Actually, uh, it is yeah, our, our good friend Hector, Hexar, he says, it's 103. Get it right. <laughs> it's 103. And to me, to me, it was nice comparing to, to last One, week. 115, yeah. 120. Yeah, 115. And humidity around this time was like 75 degrees humidity. It was really bad. I mean, right now it's really nice outside. It's it's very, very comfortable outside. Yeah, and uh, right here, Juan Prado, beautiful weather. Ah, oh, see, sí, muy fresco, muy fresco. Everybody. Oh. Juan Prado's wow. drunk right now. <laughs> yeah, Juan Prado. Juan Prado <laughs> is, is he's probably in his backyard drinking. He's probably drunk right now. There it is. There it is. Uh, I still have that bottle of tequila from Letty, which I'm gonna run out pretty soon. Uh, Don Ramon. Come on. Hold on. Beto, that was January. Beto, that was since before COVID. Yeah, but we went on vacation. We were uh, we were locked up for a couple weeks in Tulsa, so we had had wine. I had well, beers. Oh yeah, but I can't bring that. It's almost done. But today, uh, a friend of mine, John uh, Maverick Ace, sent me a bottle of American Agave, uh, Silver Agave Spirits. It's actually out of San Diego, a small batch. So I'm gonna mix this in with uh, with some squirt. I sent uh, Michaela. Come here, Michaela. Okay. Get over now, here. Uh, now I'm curious. Hold on. So no, I'm, I'm curious. So my, my, uh, my intern today is Michaela. So Roberto's saying hi. Michaela is here today, and I she, you know we're doing homeschooling, and she's teaching me. So she is uh, my assistant today. Just how you guys have IT? Uh, no how, more. No more? He's Michaela. been fired. He's been fired. My guy's been fired. Are you the IT fine, technician fine, today? <laughs> Speak up, kid. Say yes. Yes. So say hi to everybody okay, Michaela, on Thursday. Make sure you... Make sure you stay IT because we lost one from golfing. Oh, and we lost one from vacation. I mean, everywhere, every time I ask, he's never in town. So well, we just lost her. She's ready to go draw again. So <laughs> we got McKenna. So we will we will have a, a bottle of this agave. So cheers to everybody. Uh, and uh, like I said, it's okay, a small I batch. Have a question: Monday. How is it existing that there's agave americano? Uh, it's American agave spirits. It's uh, in Poway, California. It's their own version of it. So, I don't know. Okay, take but, a chug, take a little drink, let us know what, with the expression, like, ah! Oh, well, I, well, just again, a convulsion, uh, I mean, have somebody just hit you on the back or something. Okay. Tell Michaela Ooh. not to leave too far. Yeah, Michaela. Uh, yeah, Michaela, stay close. They're telling stay you to stay here. Just in case. Stay here, don't go anywhere. Okay, hold on. How does it smell? Give us a little visual or audio. How does it ah, smell? See, now you're like Rosalie. You're telling me how to do the show. No, no, no. How does oh, it smell? Up. How does it smell? It actually smells really good. Okay, yeah. good. Start on your chin, move up to your lip, and then to your nose. Which chin? That's how I, which bend. chin? I got three. Oh, no. The, 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 your chin chin. Your chinny okay. chin chin. Start here? Start on your chin. Hold on. Let me, let me tuck them in. And then get a, a good... Go to your lip. Now get the same. Now go to your nose. And obviously it's getting your senses yeah, accustomed to different senses. Now when you taste, just taste it on the tip of your tongue. So that's how you do it. You go from the chin. From the chin to the lip to the nose. And you open your mouth, right? <clears throat> it's opening up those senses. Why are you laughing, kid? He's crying. I'm working over here. He said, Daddy's looking like a... They're puppeting. You know, you know what's whatever. gonna happen tomorrow for her. And her school Zoom tomorrow. So what'd you do yesterday? You do your homework? Yeah, my dad I and his kids. To drink tequila and then mezcal. <laughs> and agave. All right, so now I don't see. If it, we do every everything here. So now, now when you're gonna drink it, don't take a big sip. Just yeah. just wet your tongue, the top tip of your tongue, and that's gonna go to the back. Ooh, it's like, it like little fire. Now the next drink. Smell it and then drink it. Now take a little bit more and that'll open up the rest of the palate. 
Ooh. Oh. Is it really strong or what? No, nah, it's it's um, it doesn't have that kick. It doesn't have like a a magical. Because you didn't. Okay, when you start right away without all these senses kicking in first, no matter what it is, as good as it could be, te llega un golpe rápido. Right yeah. now you opened it up, and it you it's prepare more yourself smoother. for it. So that's how you do tequila sipping like that. Yeah. That's yeah. how I learned cognac. Oh shit! And then I used it for everything else. Yeah. Yeah, because you, when I, when I went you to the prepare yourself to to drink it, if you mm -hmm. hit it from from just straight like that, you're gonna have a different. Yeah, because uh -huh. when I went to tequila, we would do that, and then they give you like a the tequila plant, and you would like chew on that. They would give you like coffee beans and chocolate in the city of tequila. That's it. To change to the change flavor, the if you're gonna taste another. Uh huh. Uh -huh. So uh -huh. now and this that's one why, already like, with wine. Yeah, with the wine, I'm already. You have to mm -hmm. open up the smell. And then the palate comes next. See, we do everything on Thursdays. We teach you about Palace. boxing, teach you about how to be fancy Mexicans. We teach you how to do everything. And so now this one, I shoot it or I just sip it? No, no, no. Don't shoot it. Don't shoot it. Don't shoot it. Just, just sip. It sip sips. That's a good. That's a good. That, that's how you enjoy tequila. Exactly. The shooting. Uh, when we went to Tijuana, and, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 you get those. <laughs> oh, this is the greatest tequila because it tasted nasty. That's not true. The so, great tequila is smooth, tastes like syrup, and then yeah. I need a guy. At, yeah, I need a guy that pops some beer with the whistle, and then the matraca. That that makes oh. it happen. No, they have the cheapest tequila. That's why oh. they do it. That's mm -hmm. what you this get. This is pretty good. You get drunk so fast, and then they shake your head and stuff. No, no. Don't do that. Yeah. Ah, this is pretty good. Thanks to uh, John Maverick Ace in Oceanside hooking me up. This is pretty good. American Agave. It's a company that he started working for. It's a 100% blue agave. It's cool. This is actually really, really good. I was surprised. I, I didn't, just like you, I didn't know what was going to happen, but there it is. All right, now I'm going to make my drink. All right, thank you, everybody. All right, so, uh, Joel, you. Yes, sir. Uh, your update on you. What do you have on your schedule? I know you have a lot of different things going on. Uh, but what is it that's coming up for you? Well, right now, i got a, a few fights from some of the kids in our, in our gym. I have uh, actually one, one kid from my gym uh, fighting at the Thompson card. Uh, yeah, ma six. making his debut, correct? Uh, yes, he's been making his debut. And as a matter of fact, recent, I mean, like a few minutes ago, I already got another fighter fight on the same card because uh, I think uh, Georgia Costa's opponent uh, had an accident uh. Uh, uh, on the road and uh, I, uh, I used to train a kid from uh, Phoenix, Charlie Velasquez and his father had called me yesterday asking me you know, or telling me, basically telling me that his kids were ready so it was a good opportunity for, for Charlie Velasquez to step up against uh, Georgia Costa and uh, right now I, I just closed the deal with him I mean, he's training in Phoenix with his dad, but, you know, George Acosta uh, was scheduled to fight. And then I have a kid uh, fighting sep uh, September 6th, uh, Batir Akhmedov, that kid that fought Mario Barrios oh, yeah. for the world title. Oh. He's fighting on, in L.A. At, uh, on, the, on the PBC show September, uh, September 6th. So I'll be out there. Hi, get the end I, I drank a little. Oh, hey, we, <laughs> hey, we we uh, we love PBC shows because we love. No, no, I, I thought I thought he said CBS and they haven't had boxing in many years. So I, yeah. I, uh, the the agave, we love PBC. Oh, uh, Ray, <laughs> what up, Ray Flores? How you doing, Ray Flores? Those, 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 are, those are those are the fights I have. Taken. I have one, and then Antonio 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 has a kid fighting in Vegas. Uh, uh, you know, Manuel Flores. So we have we have a couple couple shows coming up. Hey, as long as the kids as long as the kids are fighting and and you know what they that's what they train for to get ready for a fight. Adelante, go out there and kick some ass. And it was just yeah, a joke. Yeah, yeah, they, they need activity. Yeah, you know it's it's all we love Ray You know it's all about work. And then you know obviously it's a full circle. It's a full circle. Hoy mañana ya pasado acá, and you know it just goes round and round. And Roberto, yeah, you know, obviously, obviously Beck was supposed to fight on yeah. the, on the Golden Boy next show Saturday. Like yeah, that we had tomorrow. It was tomorrow, no? Uh, Saturday. 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 Yeah, Sometimes Saturday. we we should be so in now, we, we should be in quarantine right now. So now, so now we're just gonna wait. Oh, no, tomorrow, tomorrow. You, sorry, oh, boy. Yeah. 
Yeah, yeah, yeah. Twenty-eight. Okay. So now uh, Jeez, I'm, holding back, I'm holding back, back a little bit, and uh, you know, for whenever, whenever they reschedule again. Puta, thank God you're holding them back, porque <laughs> if not, imagínate, le va a empezar a noquear a mis coaches. Yeah. <laughs> and Roberto. However, the good news, the good news, Beck has been approved to fight for the vacant NABO title, which is the WBO organization. So now we have, currently he has a WBA title, a regional belt, international belt, sorry. If he wins in his upcoming fight, then he'll have a WBO. So even though he only has six fights, he now is going to be ranked in two different organizations out of the four sanction bodies, which as he moves up in the rankings, will give him the best opportunity to pick and choose where we're going and what direction, or to have both directions, you know? So, mm -hmm. Beck is moving very fast. There it is. There it is. And, Roberto, for Golden Boy, what's on their schedule? What are you up to? Because there's a lot of stuff going out there. Well, you know what? We're working very hard <laughs> to, uh, to get this next date. In September, it got canceled, uh, postponed. I want to say it was postponed our August date. Linares got the COVID. He's doing very well. He's already back in training out of the hospital. And we're looking to reschedule. Oh, I heard him. I heard him. He's hungry. That's not back, guys. Please, to everybody, no. that is not back. That's Joel's bulldog. Uh, that's that a bulldog? been a little bit more like, ah. Yeah. Your, I look. It's family day. You got the bulldog. Look, look Michaela, here. There's there's another Diaz kid, right there in the corner. The the bulldogs there. We got all kinds of stuff going on. It's a family affair here on Thursdays. All right. Actually, here we, actually, she's sitting next to me because nobody else is home. <laughs> she goes. He's still playing golf. Yeah, he just left. He just left right now. He didn't even say where he's going. So everybody, everybody else is gone. It's just me and her. So she's right here watching the dogs. Uh, the struggle is super real. I mean, th this is real, 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 real. There's nothing about this as tape or fake at uh. all. All right, here we go. Now, uh, today's theme, I was asking about this, where we're going on, and I told everybody or involved with the show, hey, this is what I want to do. We'll talk about this before we get to your questions, get going, because last week, Roberto, we only did the show for an hour because Razo, you know, he just didn't bring it. Razo didn't bring it last week. And uh, so we cut the show down for a little bit. But what we're doing today is I wanted to start about this because I was watching Eddie Hearn's um, fight camp in his backyard at Essex County. And I'm like, wow, that is so cool how the different venues you're trying to figure out. I worked with Matchroom with Joel in uh, Tulsa where it was in the middle of the street. And by working a Matchroom show, Roberto, I must have got a couple hundred followers from the Brits. right? I got a, a, almost 500 from the Uzbeks. So I have all these new followers and... People were sending me messages about uh, my old pictures. They're like, oh, you work for Golden Boy. That's good. Like, just fans. And you've told me this, Roberto, that the uh, British fans are unique. Joel's told me this about their experience back there. But I really want to get into this. Uh, now that I'm experiencing it a little bit, the British boxing scene right now is huge. The Mexicans are always going to say, we're big, we're this and that. But the, the British scene is huge right now. And what is it, Roberto, start with you, that makes them so passionate for boxing they're very passionate and supportive of their he heroes you want to call it or their team or or <laughs> whoever they go with i i my first experience was unbelievable i'll never forget it it was through ricky hatton one of the maybe not one of the best in the history of british boxing but definitely the most loved in the history of British boxing. He united Manchester like nobody else could. Really? Because he was one of the fellas. Everybody knew or everybody had a story about Ricky Hatton, whether they played darts with him, whether they played uh, whatever, you know, soccer with him, whether they drank with him, whether they seen him fight. But Ricky was one of the people. So when he came out to the U.S., and I met him at a very, very young age. He was a big fan of Mexican boxing. His boxing hero is Roberto Duran. Really? That's his hero. Roberto Duran is his hero. You would think, as a British fighter, it would be a British great fighter. Yeah. And 
he labeled himself as a young fighter as the Manchester Mexican. Really? Because he fought like a Mexican. In his eyes, he 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 got into the trenches, worked the body. You know, Ricky was very rough. It wasn't faints. It wasn't boxing. He would get in there and let's go. He would get cut, hit, eh, pero he would keep going. He's up now. A representative of Manchester that, regardless of the ring, regardless of they they had a tough upbringing and and it's never been easy. So that's why he has the love of these people. So when he came out to Vegas, his very first time, came out to watch a fight. It was a Barrera fight. He wanted to meet Barrera. He was very young still, and we introduced him to Barrera. Hey, Barrera, there's this young kid from England, great young fighter. He wants to. Meet. And they became very good friends. So much that there was one point when Ricky, Marco asked Ricky to walk me out to the ring. Really? And Ricky walked Marco out to the ring. A few fights later, Mar uh, Ricky asked Marco, hey, will you walk me out to the ring? And it was against Jose Luis Castillo. No way. Oh. Being another Mexican, Marco was like, oh, fuck. You know, what are the people in Mexico going to say? My yeah. fans, what is Castillo going to say? So he talked to Castillo and he told him, hey, he's my friend. He wants me to walk him out. I just don't want to, you know, yeah. and Castillo's like, no, bro, it's cool. Courtesy. You know, out of courtesy, exactly. Not permiso, but it was courtesy. courtesy. And Castillo even told Marco, no, 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 I know you guys are friends. Yeah. Adelante. And Marco and Wayne Rooney, great soccer player that played for Manchester United, played on the national team walked Ricky Hack Hatton out that night. So the, the back to your question is, you're absolutely right. First of all, they love sports. Yeah. They, they love, they have passion. They support their sport. That's why you see in the UK, the ticket prices are very different than in Vegas. Mm -hmm. You're not going to see, you know, two, three thousand dollar ringside tickets. But you are going to see 50, 60,000 attendants. Wait, so how much do they sell them for? There's much lower prices. Okay. But much bigger crowd. They may possibly be even a little bit less in total. But the ambience is incredible. Yeah. Because if you have, look, think of it. You have a club show, but the ticket prices are extremely high. And you can make more money with less people. It's better. Less security, less problems, less issues. But there... And in the UK, it's an event. Mm. Anybody that's ever been to a fight in the U in the UK, when when they all start singing together as one, oh yeah, what, whatever song, whatever chorus, whatever, it's amazing. It's amazing. It's it's an ambience that you're like, I'll never forget this. Wait, yeah. so it's an, unfor it's, a, it's an unforgettable experience. I'm telling you that. Yep. Yep. Okay, so they pl they fight in the big arenas. I mean, for the bigger shows, you know, you mentioned fifty, sixty thousand, but Roberto. You can't see anything. It's hard to see it at a 20,000 T-Mobile, but they still go? You're absolutely right. Maybe in the boon, in the high seats, you're not going to see anything. You're going to see... Pero you're, you're, you're in, so it don't matter. Yeah, they're drinking. <laughs> they're all singing together. It's el ambiente that they're having. And it's incredible. It's incredible. I mean, I was up in the ring a couple of times waiting for the fight walkouts, and I start hearing the... First of all, when they start singing Sweet Caroline, yeah. and, and then they start all bah, singing bah, together, bah. <laughs> it's incredible. I mean, look, you get goosebumps. And then they all, the, they all turn on the lights on the phones. On the phones, and you see, yeah, like, you they see turn off the lights, people. and, you know, Canada tried to do something similar. You know, when we went out with Bernard Hopkins and Pascal, in the U.S., I mean, there's those, you know, the Canelo fights, or back in Oscars fights, or Mayweather fights. 20,000 people and it, yeah it's a lot of people and it's for us it's an experience but when you hear the whole arena singing one song in fact when Ricky fought Mayweather and it was all Ricky fans in the weigh-in yeah and he pulled the microphone and said are you all here to see him and they said no are you here to see me and they said, yes. So let's fucking do it. <laughs> the weigh-in, the weigh-in was amazing. Oh, man. 
man. It's uh. I was there. I've told that story many times that I was there for Mayweather Hatton in the uh, auxiliary where I watched it on closed circuit and everybody, there's only one Ricky Hatton. I didn't have a ticket. I've said this story. I didn't have a ticket, but I'm playing craps and I see the big British contingent coming down and I'm like, what's going on? And I, I lose money. I'm out of it. I just start walking with them singing. There's only one Ricky Hatton. They have the flags. They walked into that ballroom. And nobody was checking tickets. They just, there was so many, it was hundreds of people. They just walked into the ballroom. So that's how I got into the ballroom because no security is going to stop you. This is before social media. They just kept going one Ricky. So I'm thinking one Ricky Hatton. And then as soon as the fight starts, I'm away from you because he's going to get his ass kicked as I know. And then there, but then he gets knocked out and it gets quiet in that uh, closed circuit room, right? 20 seconds later, there's only one Ricky Hatton. The dude just got knocked out. Absolutely right, because when he came back to fight Sajenko after retiring for a few years, after going through a a battle in its own, um, he had a battle with alcohol and a little bit of outside issues, and he decides to come back. And he loses the fight with Sajenko. Obviously, before the fight, you start hearing that, what you missed. If you had lived it before, there's only one Ricky Hatton, only one. And you're like, wow, man, I really miss this. You don't know you what you miss until it's gone. And the fight starts. He looks out of distance. Uh, he looks, the timing's not there. You know, it, just, it wasn't the right time for that fight. And then he loses with a body shot. There's a silence. You can hear a pen drop. And then, there's only one. (laughs) And why? Why? He lost. Why? You know why? To lift him up. At least, our guy lost. But, let's lift his spirits because we still love him. And that's where, I don't want to say in America, but that's what we see here a lot. Our guy loses, and guess what? Uh, he wasn't that good anymore. He saw da da da, and we jumped the bandwagon. The yeah. next guy is the better guy. So there they show. I'm gonna support you, win or lose, and that's beautiful. I'm win showing or draw. Yeah. I'm showing the poster right now that you sent me. Mayweather Hatton, December eighth, two thousand seven, MGM Grand Golden Boy Promotions and Mayweather Promotions. What was it like for that fight? Well, personally, for me, it was very satisfying because. The, that was the first fight with Golden Boy. Oh. It was the satisfying at the moment. Obviously, it would have been more satisfying should should have uh, Ricky had won. But it was the first fight with Golden Boy because one fight prior, he had fought Jose Luis Castillo. He was signed to another promoter who that day his contract was ending when he beat Castillo. Bob Arum and that promoter were the promoters of that show. While they're waiting for Ricky to come out after the Castillo win to do the post-press conference, Ricky and Golden Boy and I had already set up a meeting and had already agreed on after my last fight, if I after this fight, if I win, I want to work with you guys. So we tie that up. Oscar calls Ricky in the dressing room, congratulates him. Hey, great job. Talk to you soon. Let's work on the next fight. Enjoy. Take your vacation. And then we go to the post-press conference, and Bob, Bob welcomes Ricky and says, on to the next. And Ricky says, I just want to let everybody know, I just got a call from Oscar De La Hoya, and we'll be working soon. And everybody was in shock. Media, everybody was like, what? Nobody that. It came out of left field. And Ricky, a few days later, announces he uh, joins Golden Boy. And then on to the Mayweather fight. For that fight, Beto, it was obviously the biggest fight at the moment. Ricky actually asked Golden Boy, he had never fought at the MGM, how many seats, uh, what's the capacity? I think they told him it's like 18,800, whatever the capacity is. Okay, I want all the seats. I'll buy them all. No! I'll buy all the tickets. I don't know (laughs) any fighter. I don't know of any fighter. That has said, I'll buy all the tickets. Look, any fighter says, I, I need to buy 100, 200, 300. I got family, friends. 
Ricky wanted all the seat, all the whole venue, and they said, "Wait, hold on, Ricky, you cannot buy the yeah. whole venue." First of all, their sponsors, the casino for the high rollers, there's public sale. Mayweather has to get tickets. Uh, there's undercard obligations. Yeah. We have to get tickets. The promotion has to get tickets. I mean, no, you can't have. Okay, well, how many can I have? I think they told him it was like 5,000 tickets you can have. Okay, I'll buy them. He was upset because he could only <laughs> buy 5,000. Is he like a ticket broker now or what? The thing is, in he knew in the UK, the soldier, the the, the Hatton, uh, what do you call it? The Hatton mania yeah, was, was going to be present. So he had to go back to the UK and say, you can only buy tickets if you win a lottery. You had to apply what? and and be drawn. So, although there was only five th- five thousand tickets available to them, I don't remember if the number was thirty five thousand Brits came to Vegas that weekend. <laughs> Many bought tickets after market. Many bought tickets that didn't exist. They oh. showed up and said, "Sorry, this is not a good ticket." Many were just there to watch it on. Like you said, yeah, in close the circuit. Rooms, in a, on screen, in the pay-per-views, in the closed circuit. Yeah. And many just were there for the weekend because the t- at that time, the dollar and the pound was very different. It was beneficial for them. So they made a vacation of it. Yeah. And that weekend was UK. It wasn't America. It was, it was crazy. It was UK. It was crazy because the reason I was there is my buddy Steve uh, got... Uh, invited to play a, a poker, tr- oh no, uh, some kind of blackjack tournament, some kind of tournament at, at New York, New York. So we're at New York, New York. I didn't even know there was a fight going on. I, I wasn't working in boxing yet, and we're playing, or he's playing, and I'm, you know, I'm the I'm the good cheerleader. I had the guy, with, I'm the towel right there. I'm ready to go. And then the British guys are like, Hatton's fighting, Hatton's fighting. So my buddy Steve's like, oh, we'll go. He asked his casino host at New York, New York, hey, what are the odds that we can get some tickets for this Mayweather fight? The guy said. If you get any, let me know because nobody has a ticket to this fight because the Brits had taken over everything. And it was just, the, I didn't realize this, but you look around, you're like, everybody is a British guy. They have the t shirts, they have the flags, everything. And that they had arrived since Monday, just like how you said. That's what the casino host said. That was before, you know, the grand arrivals that we have now. It used to be, now it used to be, if you go for a fight, it'd be Friday, Saturday, Sunday. Now it's everybody makes a vacation on Monday. It was one of the most surrealist things I've ever seen. That's why I wanted to get into the story and like the, the what's going on. And it wasn't just Hatton. Like coach, you've talked about this. Your experiences. Were you around for Hatton at all? Uh, I I wasn't there. Oh, okay. I wasn't there for the fight. I watched it. I watched it at home. But I mean, I've been to England many times, and uh, the crowd is totally different. I mean, you can tell. You know what I noticed. The very first time that I went to England for a fight was when uh, Tim Bradley fought Junior Waiter. Coming into a gym, just walking in the gym, the hospitality, the people. I mean, they're really good people. The British people out there, they, 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 they I mean, they greet you well. They take care of you. And they're, I mean, the love for the sport. And I also, I noticed, and Roberto, you, you're familiar with this. They're very, they're very similar. They have to Mexicans. Sim- exactly. Because hundred percent. They're very similar to Mexicans because I mean, they are, all they talk about is the WBC, and when it comes to equipment, they love Reyes. I mean, like, you know. you hit it right on the nail because obviously I had never been there, mm-hmm. and growing up in the U.S., yeah. so many Mexicans here, you think that Mexicans and Americans would have more in common. Yeah. And there's more in common with Brits yeah. and Mexicans. And here's where I saw it. Hanging out with the Hattons, mm-hmm. um, outside of the ring, after the gyms, going to the house. Because, like, for instance, for the Mayweather fight, the Castillo fight, mm-hmm. we would rent them houses in Vegas. Ricky had a an allergy with the air conditioning and the hotels. He didn't like the hotel, so mm-hmm. we rented them houses. Hired them chefs, hired them security, hired them everything. And being in the house after training, you play cards, you play games, you joke. And I, before, you know, at the beginning meeting them, I would see a lot of jokes. 
Now, the Manchester Manchurians mm -hmm. speak a little faster than from London, and the accent's a little heavier. So at the beginning, I couldn't understand a lot. And then as I got to know them a little bit more and, and get a little bit more accustomed, I would l did they say what they said in the re in the way that I think they're saying it? Mm -hmm. But now I'm thinking as a Mexican, like I'm translating it Ooh. as a as a Mexican. They're little side jokes and uh, mm -hmm. they can't and then I'd see them, I'd hear them laugh. And I'm like, wait a minute. So what it means is the Brits have a lot of double meaning. Como doble, doble, como, doble sentido. Doble sentido. Like como, Mexicans. Como el Mexicano, yeah. it, and Americans don't have that type of humor. It's a little bit more dry with the Americans. So that's where I found a lot more in common with the Brits as a Mexican, not as an American, obviously Mexican-American, but separating both, there's a lot more in common between the Mexicans and the British. Now, what, what, what Joel is saying is they love Reyes. They look up to Mexican fighters. I mean, Ricky was a big fan of Duran. Not Mexican, 100%. I mean, Panamanian. But he was a big fan of Barrera. Mm -hmm. And his Pancho said the Manchester, the Mexican Manchester. No. Uh, the Manche Mexican Manchester. Manchester Mexican. Something the like Ma that. The Manchester Mexican. <laughs> and for the fight with Castillo, he asked me, do you think it's okay if I wear this out of respect for the Mexicans or will they get offended? I said, Ricky, not with you mm -hmm. because you fight like a Mexican. So should you win? They're going to respect you. Yeah. I had a, a, a sombrero of Man City Colors made in Guadalajara and he wore it that night. So he wore the sombrero charro, light blue, it said uh, El Maton, uh, Manchester, El Maton de Manchester, something like that on top. <laughs> and then he had the poncho yeah. that said the Mexican Manchester, Wait, Manchester Mexicans. That was against who? Jose Luis Castillo. Now, Roberto, um, I'm going to look for that picture right now. But you, how do you get a sombrero made in Guadalajara for a British guy? How does that even cost your mind? No, so so he asked, can I, do you think they'll get mad if, if I, I said... Not only will they not get mad, they'll respect you, they'll admire you. I'm going to make the sombrero. And I had like five or six made in Guadalajara. He wore one, and they gave out to fans that were there more. So, so yeah, yeah. But, Roberto, you have a sombrero guy on speed dial ready to go? No, no, no. no <laughs> so when he asked me, I called family in Guadalajara. Carla called her tia, who lives in Guadalajara, and said, Hey, tia, do you have... Yeah, Vicente Fernandez is guy that makes a sombrero, <laughs> this and that. And we had a, a... I mean, it was a... Look look at the YouTube when he walks out. I'm looking at it right now. Beautiful sombrero. We had that made in Guadalajara for him. Roberto, you just said that Vicente Fernandez's guy is also Ricky Hatton's sombrero guy. Well... We borrowed him for one day to make him a hat. It this wasn't Ricky had a guy, but we borrowed him. It had to be something top. We didn't want just any sombrero from a from a vendor. But this is why Thursday is is the show of the fancy Mexicans as Roberto drinks his uh, fancy Bordeaux. You could have just gone to like the indoor and got a, a sombrero. No, he only wore it for thirty seconds. You might be lucky to walk into a, a swami and find one the same color, but it's rare. I mean, in Mexico, whatever you want. May they'll make it for you, especially in Guadalajara. Oh, you know, there's, yeah. I mean, I muchos artesanos over there. Uh, the artesanos they make you whatever you want. So it was a custom Ricky Hatton one. Yeah, the colors that he wanted. In fact, in fact, because it had to be specific to the team, Manchester City, and to his shorts and trunks and everything, they sent me a. ¿Cómo se llama? A swap. Like a a swap. Yes, so chingo. A swab, oh, sea. and it had to be this color, and it, obviously the terciopelo mm -hmm. of that color, and they made it specifically to that color to match his wardrobe. They wrote up on top, like with letters of of uh, the little beats that they do, the little la lentejuela, la... lentejuela, exacto, yeah. and it said uh, el maton de Manchester, something like that, because the hitman. But it was all in Spanish. Okay, but now, this is a great question from Juan Tejana. ¿Dónde está el sombrero? The original one? Yeah. 
Ricky has it. Oh, he does have it. Yeah, yeah, Ricky kept it. Ricky kept it. Roberto, come on, bro. I have the trunks. The, yeah. the backup trunks. I, I have it. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. I know. I keep the hat. I know you have. The... I couldn't say. Oh, it was just a borrow. <laughs> I oh, should have. That, so, all right, how much did that sombrero cost? The sombrero cost five hundred dollars. Five hundred dollars in two thousand, the mid two thousands, to get shipped from. So you, how do you make that phone call? See, I got all these weird questions. How do you make the phone call to say, "Hey, señor, que hace los sombreros de Vicente Fernandez? I need you to make a Manchester Mexican sombrero for Ricky Hatton." How does that phone call so, go? So right when he brings up the question, you think they'll get offended, the Mexican fans? And first of all, let me tell you, uh, the fight was at Thomas and Mac. If he would have known, he wouldn't have asked the question. And here's why: I think that Thomas and Mac holds fifteen thousand. Yeah, it was only fifteen Mexicans. <laughs> <laughs> and myself, and myself, sixteen. Sorry, sixteen. <sighs> Everybody else was Brit. So if he would have offended. With no disrespect to our, to oh, my people, to our people, it wasn't going to make a big difference. <laughs> so I said, never will you disrespect them because you honor the Mexican people. As a Mexican, I'll tell you, you fight like a Mexican. Barrera's walking you out. He's a Mexican. Uh, you're going to come out with your pancho. In fact, I'm going to get you your sombrero. Don't worry about it. Now, Ricky, if you go out there and start running and payaseando... And, and, and sticking out your tongue and not fighting, oh, yeah. then you're going to offend not only the Mexicans, oh, yeah. you're going to offend everybody else. Everybody, yeah. And that's not Ricky's style. So he's like, okay, let's do it. I give him a lot of credit because he had the courage to say, let's do it. But he did check. He did check. He was worried about, I don't want to offend anybody. You know, Floyd, Respect. Floyd, I, I forget what fight Floyd did. I don't know if it was with Oscar. Yeah, it was with Oscar, right? He did a, he did a it was, right? He came out in all the Mexican colors. Yeah. Yeah, I bet a lot of people don't know this. He had the sombrero backwards. Yeah, he did. He did! And, and that is more offensive. Yeah, that's disrespectful, yeah. Huh? Because you don't even know how to wear the sombrero. It was just a gimmick. And no disrespect. I mean, he's a great fighter. great, And it was a great idea. Okay, whatever you want. But you wore the sombrero backwards, bro. So next time, learn how to wear it first. But Ricky wore it proudly, yeah. fought proudly, knocked out Castillo, and with all shots, with a body shot, the Mexican hook to the body. Excellent. So when I got the idea, Carla's aunt lives in Guadalajara. Obviously, everybody knows everybody in Guadalajara. And I, por favor, nos pueden hacer este sombrero. We need this. It has to be special. It's for a fighter. He's not just any fight. It's, it's a big fight. So they went straight to the people that make Vicente Fernandez's outfits and sombreros and trajes charros and said, here's a swab and this is what we want. His hat was 500 or his sombrero, sorry, not his hat. His sombrero was 500. The replicas were 50. Oh, sorry, 150. Oh, oh, 150. You, you, have your, uh, you have your assistants also too? I have my IT. My IT, my IT. My IT. <laughs> you have your research department there. Okay, that's good, that's yeah. good. I got human resources over here, like Antonio. Antonio. All right, so I, I just found the picture. I found the YouTube, and I'm going to blow it up. You guys can't see this, but people on side. It's uh, it, on the back of the sombrero, it says Matador. Oh, Matador. Matador. matador okay. a, a, arriba del sombrero says Matador. And then his serape, which was a nice blue, says Manchester Mexican. That's what he go. wore. It, it was... Uh, I found it. Only one Utah I found it right there. So it's coming through. So those people can see it right there. So it was a big one. But he was, the video I saw, Roberto, he was walking out and somebody had to put the sombrero on him. So it was a pretty cool experience. And you're right. It looks fresh, man. Matador on top. Uh, and it's just, you know, Roberto, I know you're, you're still cool with Ricky, but if you can, uh, you know, ask to borrow it. That'd be pretty nice for us. You know, if you can do that. Borrow <laughs> <laughs> for the show. Just borrow for the so show. Raz, you can put it on yeah, in. we'll put it on Razo. The, but I, I mean, the IT department. I mean, not the IT department. The uh, the replica is 150. The real one's 500. That's pretty cool. I mean, the little details that go into that. And that night, obviously, like I said, there was. 50 Mexicans and 14,985 <laughs> Brits. He had a, a like two or three different soccer teams there. 
he had famous singers there. Uh, the 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 movie star um, Transporter was there. Uh, Wayne Rooney obviously yeah. walked him out. So after the fight, we were all at the wind hanging out. See, that's another thing with Ricky and the Brits that was very fun. His team would sell packages in the UK. So let's just say the ticket was five hundred dollars for ringside. You would pay one thousand, fly to Vegas, and that would give you a ringside ticket. Prior to the fight, you had an experience to go into this restaurant bar at the hotel and and live music, drinks and food. Like a nice little VIP setup. With Tom they Jones. Trans- they would transport you to the venue. You'd watch the fight. They transport you back after the fight. Ah, drunk. To be in a <laughs> venue because Ricky would rent a salon and party. No way. Dinner and drinks at the win. We were at the win. He had a big old ballroom where everybody that paid for that, let's say that five hundred dollar ticket, but they paid a thousand. They can go into this ballroom. They had a wristband. You walk in. And you have a night with Ricky Hatton. So he's doing a meet and greet. He's like a comedian. Like, you know. After the fight, huh? It was, was amazing. Awesome. I had never seen that because what happens here in the U.S.? The fight's over. <laughs> cada quien a su lado. Everybody goes yeah. do their own thing. You don't see the fighter. Maybe you'll bump into him at a club or this and that. But here you had the chance to go into a private party with Ricky Hatton. And once he had a couple of drinks after the fight, he'd get up on the table and sing a song and you'd see all the Brits gather around the table no way and sing along with them Alueta, alue, alueta, alue. and oh my god he would keep going for hours well didn't they have that other one um walking in a hat in wonderland like it, that's only one ricky hatton that's only one yeah, that's the same one. Oh, oh. yeah so it's I, you can tell i was ha- i was hammered one ricky hatton okay only one ricky hatton walking along singing a song Walking in a hat in Wonderland. Yeah. There's only, only one. one. <laughs> <laughs> Roberto knows them all. Yeah, you got to. I never got here's that far. The wor- here's the worst type, Joel. Here's the worst part. So my first experience is with Ricky. I hear the song and I'm like, man, this guy's huge. He even has a song. Mm-hmm. I go to England or London years later. And there's a young kid in the amateurs that I go see with his manager and trainer, and his kid's named George Groves, who later be- later became a world champion. Mm-hmm. Good good friend of mine as well. Mm-hmm. And I'm at this amateur show, and all the fans start singing. There's only one George Groves, only one <laughs> George. Gro-. And I'm like, hey, they're copying Ricky's song. All right. You know what I found out later? Mm-hmm. It's not Ricky's song. Really? They use it for whatever name. Oh, I went, oh. I, I, went, I went to a Manchester United game. There's only one Wayne Rooney. Uh, mm-hmm. If you show up and they love you well, there, there's only one Joel Diaz. There's a, it just happened to sound so smooth with Ricky Hatton. There's only one Razo. There's no, only no, one Razo. No pega, no pega. No, yeah. Hey, no, yeah. There's only one Razo giving us instructions. There you go. Hey, saludos, uh, our good friend Beto Gomez, who reminds you to like, rate, and uh, hit the like button on the YouTube page. He wants to go to a fight in Vegas. That's what we're doing. We're getting everybody ready to go to a fight somewhere. And if you've never experienced a Vegas fight, there's nothing like it. Coach, you said the first time you went to London across the, as you say, across the pond, you uh, were there with Junior Witter. Okay. Mm-hmm. Muchacho de Michoacán. Indio born, Coachella Valley, you land mm-hmm. in Heathrow. What was that like for you? It was crazy, man. <laughs> All these Mexicans here. <laughs> man. I don't even know if I was legal at that time. Um, but <laughs> it was a great experience because, I mean, first of all, as I arrived there, I mean, all the boxing fans, they greet you well. I mean, you feel, you feel that good vibe, you know, that the good energy of the people. Once you walk into the arena, and Rick, um, 
Junior Witter at the time, he had a lot of fans. He was he was liked by 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 a lot of people. It was the it was a full house. Walking into that arena, obviously Tim Bradley arrived there to fight for a world title, something that belonged to them. And I mean, they were attacking Bradley really bad, insulting him and but there was just a group of, of, of people that were drunk on the way into the ring. After the fight, Tim Bradley wins. We're in the dressing room, and we walk out of the dressing room. There's a line of people waiting for Bradley to take a picture with him. I mean, I mean, it, it, was, it was a good feeling because we went there to do our job. We came back with a title, and not only that, we, we left behind a great memory with a lot of people, pictures, autographs. People were great, man. It's a, it was a great story with, with Bradley, with Julio, with, uh, with Diego Magdaleno, who fought Flanagan. You know, all the times I've been to England, and recently, one of the biggest places I've been, honestly, I've been in boxing for many, many years, but never been in a crowd as big as Joshua Povetkin. Oh, you were there for that? It was, I mean, I took uh, Chakram Giasov, I fought on the card, early in the card. And by the time the main events, the, the main event started, we were in the dressing room. And we had good seating. We had a good seating. So when it was time for the, for the main event, we left the dressing room, walking to watch the fight. We never found our seat. That's how big that arena is. The security was like, oh, you have to go over there. We go, you have to go over there. I, Anthony Josh was coming out of the dressing room with fire and, you know, <laughs> fireworks. By the time he gets to the ring, the fight starts. You just want to sit down to, to, to watch. We never found our seats. That's how big the arena was. We moved from one place to another. We never found our seats. Was that Wembley? Yeah, Wembley. Oh, we decided, my God. We decided to stand. We decided to stand and watch the fight from far away because we couldn't find our seats. We went through security, to, uh, from security to security. Oh, you guys got to go over there. And then, no, we got to go over there. At the end of the night, the fight ended by knockout, and we never found our seat. Wow. You know why, though? Sec Beto, security sells his seats. They were empty, so the security sold them. So <laughs> they, they, se, lo, se lo reparten entre seguridad. So when, when somebody's looking for the seat, Oh, it's over there, it's over there, it's over there. So he'll never find a seat, so... No! Sold already. <laughs> no, I'm just kidding, I'm just kidding. Oh, oh. But it sounds good, right? It sounds good. That, that sounds like teaching. It, it might be true, it might be true. That sounds like Tijuana. I just got a text, I just got a text of the top 10 British champions in history. Hi. Hector Lopez sent it to me. I don't agree with the, with the list, how it has it. They have Joe Calzaghe, number one. That's that's acceptable because he retired undefeated. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, Lennox Lewis number two, Ken Buchanan number three, Barry McGuigan number four, oh. Lloyd Honeygan number five, Ricky Hatton number six, John Conte number seven, Chris Eubank number eight, Nigel Ben number nine, and Nassim Hamed number ten. The only thing I don't agree with is to me, and I hated him at the time. Nassim Hamed should be much closer to the top five in the world. Man, he was you... amazing. I didn't like him because he was <laughs> arrogant. He was, at the time... He was coming in on carpets, man. Roberto, but he backed it up. <laughs> yeah. But he backed it up, exactly. He backed it up. Coach, he, he just, knocked he, people out. He wasn't just an arrogant fighter that would get in the ring and just be arrogant and then, you know, get beat up. He would literally beat his opponents down. Yeah. With his with his character. I mean, he was he was playful. He was arrogant. He was uh, cocky, but he will back up every single action, Roberto. Today, as a fan, mm -hmm. as a promoter, I wish I had Nasim Hamed lined up. <laughs> yeah. Because entertaining. At the end of the day, at the end of the day, it's entertainment. Mm -hmm. And we're seeing the same chingadera every day and, and talking, ah, I'm going to knock him out. You know what? He was colorful. He was a mini Muhammad Ali. I th I don't, I've never asked him, but I guarantee you Muhammad Ali was his idol or somebody he looked up to because he was very similar to Muhammad Ali. He talked, but he backed right. it up. 
See, I, and today we missed that. Yeah, with Barrera, it's uh, everybody's making the comments right now. Until Barrera whooped him. Until Barrera whooped him. Until Barrera whooped him. So, uh, Freddie Prince Jr. The and, actor, and I was with Barrera. So yes, yeah, I love yeah. it. So but, that's why I wanted. But, that's why I wanted to get to it, Roberto because I knew I was going yeah. to get you with this. So Freddie Prince Jr. The actor, good friend of mine. You know, that's the only guy I know. But he said Freddie grew up in Albuquerque, New Mexico, going to Johnny Tapia's gym, and he said he was a kid. He would go there, and Tapia would always tell him. Hamed, Hamed, and Johnny Tapia, RIP. I got him right here. I got the Johnny Tapia shirt back here. Um, yeah, yeah. So um, he always said, Hamed, he's a fighter. He's a fighter. And Freddie was a kid, was like, fuck him. I hate him. I can't stand him. He's too cocky. He goes, you can be cocky when you back it up. And mm -hmm. that was Johnny Tapia's line. Me be that loca, Johnny Tapia, who you would think yeah. would be the opposite, was like, until you back it up, you're okay. So with Barrera and Hamed, Roberto, that's what I wanted to lead you to. Because everybody has an opinion on this. When you saw Hamed around, what was that like? At the time, I couldn't stand him. <laughs> no Mexican because, could. No Mexican no, could. Because he was our opponent. He was my guy. My my. Okay, hey, he. We gotta beat him. I believed Marco was gonna beat him, but probably only only because. I believe that Marco, in reality, I think the odds were huge. That night at the MGM, 90% was Hamed, British. The 10% that were with Marco, 5% were Irish and 5% were Mexican. <laughs> the Irish were, were Marco because of Ireland and, and, and UK and England. Jason Quigley told me years ago that he became a fan of boxing and wanted to be a boxer when he saw that fight and became a big fan of Barrera. But it was, at that time, I didn't like Ahmed. He was arrogant, cocky. Like Joel said, he backed it up. Yes, there was confidence because you believe in your guy at the moment that yeah, we're going to win. Marco was very confident going into the fight. He trained very hard. But now, years later, I'm still shocked that Marco won the fight because he, he fought disciplined. He shouldn't have won the fight. In other words, why am I shocked? Now looking at Styles make fights, mm -hmm. Marco should not have won that fight. Stylistically, no. No. Marco was aggressive. You go towards Hamed, he's so awkward, pulls back, comes in with that shot, hits you when you're not expecting it, and knocks you out. Marco fought very disciplined that night. Jabbed. You don't jab a southpaw. One with the left hand. Normally it's the right hand that beats a southpaw. He didn't attack Hamed. He stayed waiting like a counterpuncher, which wasn't his style. But that's where I show, I'm saying the discipline won that fight. Did Barrera hit him? Another thing I saw. Oh, no. I'm no. on my oh, go ahead, Joel. Based on my experience, <clears throat> I'm going to tell you a big factor in the fight was. Now, see, Mohamed build a reputation of, of his style, right? He will make you miss and counter you. I mean, he will stand in front of you while you were throwing punches and you would not even touch him because he was good. Moving. So most of, the, most of his other opponents walked in the ring, intimidated everybody with that intimidation of, oh, this guy's, this guy's awkward. He's going to make me miss. And obviously, as a fighter, if you miss a punch, and every time you miss a punch, you get hit, it's like, you have You that. stop throwing. You stop you throwing. throwing. The difference in the fight was this. Marco walked in the ring with no respect. Mm. That's the, that, that makes a big difference in a fight. When, when fighters walk in the ring against, an, against a fighter that has a style like, like, like uh, Nassim Hamed, they walk in with that mentality that, oh, man, if I make, if I make a mistake... I'm going to get hit. So they already have that little intimidation in them. Oh, they have that little doubt. Marco walked in the ring with no doubt and no respect. And that's what made the fight. Really? You're absolutely right. Because that night, it didn't matter if Marco was fighting Klitschko. I mean, he went with a mentality, I'm going to win. And, and, and Joel is right. A lot of Nassim's opponents were already like, Fuck, I'm fighting Nassim Hamed. Ah. Same thing that happened to Tyson opponents. 
I'm fighting Mike Tyson. And they're already 50, when the bell rings, they're already 50% defeated. Marco, when the fight was signed and announced, I remember going back to the hotel room with him. We go in the room, the door closes, it's just him and I. He jumps on the bed and says, this is the fight. Not not fight week, the, the, when the fight was made, like two months before. This is the fight that I've always wanted. This is the fight that's going to make me. Para ganarle a un loco, tienes que estar más loco. Loco, yeah. Mm. No and I'm, and I'm, yo voy a estar más loco. If you notice, in the second round, there's like a little tangling going on. They both go down. I think Hamed pulls him by the neck, and Marco knees him in the balls. No! Yeah, the referee separates him. Even the a Metro PD gets up in the ring to tell Marco, hey, take it easy. I've never seen that in all my life watching boxing. The Metro gets up and says, hey, take it easy. Maybe thinking there's going to be a riot if this turns mm -hmm. into a brawl. And Marco even finished. shows, Marco even tells the, the cop, I think, he says, <laughs> hey, pero este way me jalo. <laughs> there was no respect. There's another part in the fight when Nassim does something, and I think it's like a foul type incident. And he tries to give his hand to Marco, like, okay, I'm sorry, sorry, sorry. Marco doesn't touch gloves. It's like, F you, it's a fight. And then in the last round, he full noses him and goes and takes him straight to the corner buckle and then slap. And that's where he says, who's your daddy? Yeah. <laughs> Look, Roberto, you know what I, I, you know, based on experiences that you go through as a boxer, as a trainer, you learn a lot. Watching the fight, Marco Antonio Barrera and Nassim Hamed, you can tell on Marco's face. As soon as the bell rang, he had no intimidation. He had no respect for Barrera. I mean, for for uh, Nassim. He just wanted to just break him. Me growing up as an amateur in a couple of nationals that I went to, and I'll never forget, I I always, I, I looked up to a fighter. You probably remember because when he turned pro, he didn't last long in, 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 the, in the pro business. His name was Jeremy Williams. The heavyweight. heavyweight. Yeah, from out here in California. I think Riverside or somewhere here in L.A. Yeah, we traveled, we traveled together. I think he was Mexican-American. Era mm, like yeah. a Mexican half-blood or era yeah. morenito, americano. Morenito. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Jeremy Williams was a poison in the amateur. He would knock everybody out in the amateur. Great fighter. So, I mean... I remember him growing up, and every time we went to the national, I would watch him. He was a guy that, in the weigh-ins, he would act like Nassim Hamed. Cocky, arrogant. <clears throat> and one time I just, I don't know, I just said, I went on my way, and I said, hey, why do you do this, man? I mean, it doesn't look good on you. And he says, you know why? I went to the fights. He goes, I went the fights. I, I, I went the majority of my fights before walking in the ring. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And it's true because I remember him in a few fights in tournaments that we went to. I mean, he would intimidate his opponents so bad, Roberto. And they were the scared bell, already. When the bell rang, I mean, <clears throat> the opponents would not attack him. They'll be like, oh, you know, and you could tell the intimidation here. Mentally, they were already beat. And and that's exactly what you base, what you base yourself on. Nazim wanted to in intimidate Barrera through the whole process of the fight. Weigh-ins. You know, media and whatever. And Barrera was never intimidated. Why? I mean, ¿cómo vas a intimidar un chilango? You know what I'm saying? Yeah. I mean, I'm no, you're right. You're right because check this out, Beto. I had a heavyweight. Before I started at Golden Boy, I had a heavyweight fighter. I signed him to go Golden Boy. The kid wasn't a big heavyweight in today's standards, but the kid could punch. He went 10 and 0. Or ten and one, uh, maybe six or seven, eight knockouts. But everybody was knocking out at the beginning. He was putting to sleep. He could punch. He worked construction. So when you're hitting the hammer all day long, mm -hmm. you get this forearm that's very strong. So the kid had a lot of power. Yeah. I sent him to Joel to train because as he was growing, in, I mean, he had a short career, pro career. 
I sent him one day to to England. We're talking about the UK. I sent him to the UK to spar with David Hay. Jeez. And something happened there that he came back and he was never the same. What it was, I don't know. In fact, David told me uh, he's not even sparring with me anymore. I'm like, what? I sent him to spar with... No, we kept him here to spar with George Groves, who was a middleweight. My heavyweight sparring your middleweight? Yeah, that's cool. We'll keep him here. He's a good kid. Great kid. So I see him a couple fights. The big puncher's not throwing punches anymore. So I'm like, maybe it's the trainer. I sent him to Joel. Joel, train him. So now he's going to fight his 11th fight in Irvine against a kid he beat in the amateurs who was also undefeated. And I told him, Ashanti, Ashanti Jordan. I said, Ashanti, at the weigh-in, remind him you beat him as an amateur. Now, with smaller gloves and no headgear, you're not going to beat him. You're going to kick his ass. <laughs> but that's what I wanted him to tell his opponent at the weigh-in. Remember I beat you? You had a headgear and bigger gloves. Now I'm going to kick your ass. Because now mentally, that other guy is going to remember. He's going to go all night. No va a dormir. Oh, shit, he's true. That's right. He did beat me. And now it's smaller. So it plays an effect. Mm -hmm. Ashanti to I can't tell him that. Come on, no, no. <laughs> uh, Ashanti lost that fight. Por qué? Porque no. he didn't throw. He didn't throw. Yeah, he, he didn't throw. He lost to Joe Joe Hanks. Uh, yeah. Unanimous decision. He lost. Then he got swept sixty to fifty four on the cards. He only won one card, one round. Uh, he didn't throw. He didn't throw, and he never fought ever again. No, he retired after that. At the and it was a fighter he had already beaten. And it wasn't that he lost because Joe Hanks was so much better. Mm -hmm. It was because Ashanti didn't throw. Something happened in his trip to the UK, and Ashanti wasn't the same. Wow. He got hit pretty hard by a punch that uh, traumatized him. And he never forgot about it, and he never wanted to get hit again. Like that, that's why he was always too um, hesitant. Yeah. Hesitant. But, uh, now, I also sent Deontay Wilder when David Hay was going to fight Klitschko. I sent Deontay Wilder to spar with David Hay. And the report from David Hay and his team was every day Deontay's getting better. Every day Deontay improves. Every day Deontay gets better. And guess what? Deontay comes back, fights. Wins the world title a few years later. Yeah. But things, things like that, things like that, happen a lot. And I still remember Roberto. I still remember you, and you know, and all this time I know uh, I've known you. Some of the fighters that crossed in your life, I've met them for certain reasons. They come to me, and they've told me that's a similar, a similar situation. That happened to Omar Figueroa when he went to go spar at Wimbaledo. You know? but, Omar, but Omar Figueroa didn't do what Ashanti Jordan The opposite, did. the opposite. Yeah, he yeah. did the opposite. Omar Figueroa was a young, I think he was like 18 years old. And you sent him to spar at Wimbaledo. And Edwin Wimbaledo really hurt him. Really hurt him. Because at that time he goes, lo lastimo. And he comes to the corner and he's crying. And I'm like, hey, that's it. You know, lo And Omar was like, no, no, no. No, I'm going to get him back. And Omar pulled out that anger and said, "I'm gonna get him back." Another one that I will never, rem I will never forget was um, Alfredo Angulo. Alfredo Angulo trained here with us a while back. When at one point he went to go spell, he went to go help uh, Ricky Hatton's part. I took him. Okay, he told I took me, him. He goes, Joel. He goes, ese pinche Ricky me pegó un golpe, Joel, que duré toda la noche. <laughs> Con dolor de cabeza. Pena fuertísimo. Another kid that told me the same thing about Ricky Hatton was Marvin Quintero. Marvin Quintero mm -hmm. told me, hombre, dice, los primeros días, le hace, si no le aguantas, si, le hace, o le aguantabas o te, o te regresabas, le hace, pero ese pinche Ricky te pegaba unos golpes que durabas dos, tres días que no te recuperabas. <laughs> he, mí, was, so, he was very aggressive. He didn't have a... 
technique or anything, but he was very aggressive. Now, I, when Angulo sparred Ricky, it was for the Castillo fight. And it was the last day sparring in Vegas now. It, we're already in Vegas. I don't know how I got to meet Angulo, and I said, hey, can you come spar? He was very young. It's not, obviously, many years ago. We took a kid from San Diego named Anthony Salcido. I don't know if you remember him, coach. Yeah. Mm -hmm. He was undefeated, real good fighter. So it was Anthony Salcido and Alfredo Angulo that were Ricky's sparring partners. Ricky sparred maybe four rounds with one, four rounds with the other. The next sparring session, Domi uh, not Dominic, sorry, Anthony is Anthony. like, me duele la cabeza, I'm, I, I can't spar today. It was from the punches from the previous sparring partner. Angulo says, don't worry, you sit back. Roberto, I'll do the eight rounds. Are you sure? Yes. But I respect this because... Angulo was still not a champion, was still not known, and he told me, what do you want me to do? And I said, Ricky's fighting in a week. It's not a war here. He just needs to sweat. He just needs to work. He's the one fighting, not you. Okay? So he'd get in the ring. Come on, Ricky, hit me, hit me. Come on, work, work, work. Not trying to say, oh, fuck, Golden Boy's watching. Let me... Boom, boom, let me get a name for myself. No, he made Ricky work. Mm -hmm. Obviously, he was a little bit bigger than Ricky, yeah. and he could absorb it, but I didn't know this. I didn't know what Coach is saying, oh. that he hurt him, yet he oh. came back the next session and said, hey, let Anthony rest, and I'll do his four plus my four. And sure enough, he did. And think of it, he's from Mexicali. Castillo... Basically, grew up in Mexicali. He's from yeah. Sonora, but Castillo spent most of his time in Mexicali. If anything, it was like... He represented uh, Mexicali. Yeah, 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 you shouldn't be here. You shouldn't be here. Because you might be informing stuff. Because <laughs> at that point, at that level, you could be informing stuff. No, Angulo showed up and said, Ricky, I'm here to help you. And he did. It's uh, that, man, man. That's the part of the sport that regardless of who you are, we are here to help each other, you know? I mean, and you've seen that you've taken fighters, for example, Angulo to help uh, Ricky Hatton to fight Castillo. And it's, at the end of the day, Roberto, you see it, boxing is a, a boxing is a boxing family, and we're always going to be helping each other to give the people what they want to see. You know, it's, uh, whew, you're, um, we, Roberto, we missed you. You know, we, we, uh, you, we, we missed you. you. We love Razo, and Razo brings good stories. Uh, we love him. We love Tonio. Everybody it gets involved but there's a dynamic that we have right here and the the stories that we're told and look coach is getting all fired up because because <laughs> no, you and thank you i'm sorry that i was no, out, no, but, no, uh, no, no, no. there was perfect. some bad days there that i was like no. i need to i need it no no that's what it is because like Ra razzle's ready because if i have a, a day to miss because razzle saw the how to log in he knows the passwords he's ready to go that's the that's guy coach that's the guy uh, he even has a he even has a background <laughs> I heard, I saw, I saw. <laughs> We're right. So right now, if you're watching us, uh, get your shot, have a drink, because, uh, you know, Roberto has his, uh, you, you call that, uh, uh, what, what do you call it, Roberto? A Bordeaux? My decanter. Your decanter. Your decanter. So w once you stop buying wine in a box, you get yourself a nice decanter. You want to feel decanter. good, uh, be it all fancy. I have my agave, and I'm going to... By the way, coach, uh, I'll send out the invitations. I want to say happy belated birthday to our own Beto Duran. Oh! <laughs> and, and we're going to have a little birthday dinner here at the house. We're at Malbec, somewhere that yeah. Beto chooses. Wow. But I want to celebrate his birthday. Well, Maybe next Thursday, Diaz, we do it at a location that fits everybody so that we can uh, oh. have dinner, celebrate his birthday, have the cake, and do our well, you know podcast what? from there. Next week, Razo can do the show by himself, him and his fake friends. <laughs> <laughs> He keeps saying, you know, all my friends, all my friends, all my friend, my friend, my friend, do your own show. Uh, he was busy playing golf today, so we'll do all that. So uh, cheers and thank you very much. Uh, I turned 42 a couple weeks ago. Saludos to everybody if you're doing it. I'm not going to shoot pollito, this. Pollito, pollito. A straight shot of tequila, vámonos. Oh, straight shot. Oh. Well, let me, well, coach, you said I got to take a straight shot. Let me fill it back up Ooh, then. That was good. 
Señor de los Cielos Tequila, man. The first time I tried it, it's really good. Señor, it's very good. It's very hold good. On, on. It's a good friend of ours that makes the tequila. He's an actor. Señor he de los Cielos. He did the telenovela. Who? Is that Señor a... de los Cielos. Who? And, uh, Señor de los Cielos? Yeah, yeah, yeah. He was in San Miguel. You didn't go when, uh, when, uh, Massa almost destroyed Cano. He was there ringside with us, and uh, he's a good friend. He, I think he's out here and recently just launched uh, a big campaign with the tequila. So, yeah. all props. I, I hope it goes very well. Salud, sal, Señor de los Cielos. I guess we got a new sponsor on Thursday. Yes? Señor de los Cielos. <laughs> and so, now I'm going to take my shot right here. Yeah. Woo! And I got to teach in the morning, so. <laughs> Michaela, two plus two. A negative times a negative. We're all right. <laughs> We you are were golfing to me. I saw you were golfing with Michaela this morning. Yeah, I took my daughter. Uh, you know, we're back in school, so I took her to the driving range. I'm trying to get her into golfing because uh, there's Mexican girl scholarships out there. Get your girls playing, Coach. I'm going to say information. The Southern California PGA Tour, they do a lot of stuff for young Latinas uh, where they give them the clubs, they give them the instruction, especially out there in Coachella. So all kinds of good stuff because they, right. they can't play soccer because she's a soccer player, but she can't play any games right now. So I'm trying to get it. I'm going to tell you a quick story. Oh, poor poor story that happened, no, 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 happened coach, coach, coach. I just charged my computer. No quick story. Okay. Vámonos. Right. I, I probably played golf in my life maybe three, four times max. I go to a golf. I go, I go, I go to a, uh, I'm to a disappointed now. I'm Roberto. disappointed. I'm hurt. I'm hurt. I don't, actually. Time, Roberto, I don't have time. No. You did it three times too many. Ah, okay, okay. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. Hey. And I go because Antonio, hey, let's go golf. Antonio, I never golfed before. So at one point when I when I started just hitting the balls, I got I got so used to the the seven iron, Roberto, just the seven iron. I mean, I'm I'm the Mexican Happy Gilmore. <laughs> you, you give me you give me a seven iron, Roberto, and you tell me where you want the ball. Y ahí te la pongo, honestly. Okay. And Jolito, Jolito is my witness. Uh, and then recently I was at the gym uh, Wednesday. And Joel says, hey, Dad, you want to play golf? I mean, I hardly spend some time with my son. He's out there, here and there. I go, okay, let's go. He goes, it's you and me and Antonio and his son. I go, right. But remember, Antonio used to play golf before. Antonio used to play golf before. Yeah, and, and then he goes, okay. So I get out of the gym. I go over here. So then Joel calls me. He goes, hey, you're going to make it. I go, yeah, I'll go. So I meet him at the, at, at, at the golf place. We get our things, and we're going to get a golf cart, and we're going to walk. Now let's walk. Vamos. So we started playing, Roberto. Hey, the first, hey, we, we all tee off. Perfect. Boom. Antonio got a card, Roberto. Antonio got a card, and he was putting numbers, right? <laughs> He's keeping Antonio score? Was really, Antonio, was, Antonio was really strict with that. He's keeping oh, score. He's numbers. Oh, I don't like, we don't like those people. Okay. Look, he's, he's keeping score, but he wasn't doing good. We're beating him. <laughs> Joel and I are beating him. That's why he's not on the show today. Okay, <laughs> yeah, he has a, you're right, you're right. No comments tonight. Seriously. So all of a sudden, he's hitting the balls, and boom, they're going. We can't find him. So then later on, Antonio, how can we not keep his score? How can we not keep his score? Goes, nah, nah, let's just play for fun. I go, <laughs> if you would have been winning, you would have been keeping score. That's why. <laughs> <laughs> When we started, Roberto, he filled out the card. His name, my name, everything. And then he never kept scoring again. Yeah, he goes, nah, nah, let's just play for fun. And, I, and I, gave him, I gave him a hard time. You know then I go, Antonio, I know you. I know you. If you would have been doing good, you would have kept score. But right and now. And he would have told you, I kicked your ass. But no, no, no. Oh, and wow. Then I, was, I think it was, it was in the seventh raid hole. He hits it. Boom. And it lands on the green, Roberto. And Joel tells him, Antonio, you're in for a birdie. He goes, oh, I got this. And Joel records it. He goes, I mean, he was maybe about, about not even three feet for a birdie, right? And then we're all like, okay, Antonio, this is where you're going to redeem yourself. So Joel is recording everything. And he hits it, Roberto, and he misses it by like five inches. <laughs> like, <laughs> but he recorded it? And Joel recorded it. Joel he needs to post that on Instagram. Yeah, we, 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 need that, we need that video, like, Junior. We need that video, and my Junior. Biggest, my biggest disappointment last week, I've been seeing Eric P., Razo, Beto, Bobby, Joel, no, Joelito, everybody playing golf. And and I'm like, nobody works? 
I know, that's what I'm saying. <laughs> and the last person, and I hope he's listening right now, the last person I would have ever expected, I start seeing on his Instagram hitting the balls, and I text him, and I said, Puta mien? And he puts, eh, it, it's fun. Have you tried it? I said, no, puta mien? <laughs> and he's like, oh, next time I'll bring you. I had to get my brother out of the house just to, like, oh, so it's for your brother. <laughs> and then he goes, but it's fun. I got blisters. I got, my hands are all messed up. Aldair. Oh! jugar, <laughs> cabrón. See? Aldair and, and Chimp are playing golf. Yeah. yeah. And he said, I had to take my brother out of the yeah, house. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Here, here's, no, here's the he thing. He's not playing golf every day. Here's the he thing. Uh, I, 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 I'll take claim because, you know, I'm the fancy Mexican. I'm a Beto's ch- a bad influence, Roberto. Uh, no problem. No problem. Uh, Eric, P- no problem. Eric P. from the Golden Boy office is a CFO. Shot at 83 today. He worked people. But he doesn't count because he's a member at a country club. So, okay, must get him. Finally, Jeremiah Gallego will show up. We, our caddy is here. The ring announcer is showing oh, up. Caddy, hey. <laughs> Jeremiah. 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 But, but, but here's the man with the voice. Yeah, yeah. Hey, my, the voice. My, my friend. He's my friend. the man with the voice. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Jeremiah. And the ring. And the ring. And, and, ho- the ring. and hopefully, Jeremiah. Oh, no, you're in Austin. You're fine because I know that storm is going through uh, Texas. Oh, not Houston. Not yeah, Houston. Yeah. Not uh, But um, what's it called? Like, so here's what's going on. Because the pandemic is going on, you can't do anything. Normally, during the summer, we'd have the Golden Boy softball team. We would be playing in Pasadena. Roberto, what's the name of our softball team? The Golden Boys. No. The Golden Boys. Our, our, our softball team. What's it called? Michelada time. <laughs> yes. Yeah, 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 yeah. Normally, yeah, yeah. during the summer, our co-ed softball team is named Michelada time. We are the defending champions in Pasadena. The lowest division, but we're still the defending champions. You bring nobody your, can touch us yeah, yeah. in Pasadena. Yeah, yeah, exactly. <laughs> Yo, know, Jackie Grant plays. We have a great time. Rosal's good. Rosal's working the umpires. He's greasing it. But because of pandemic, no league. So uh, started golfing a little bit, and other people are like, "Hey, I'll go," but they think that coach that they can golf. They go to the driving range. It doesn't mean they can golf. You, you, you're just going and wasting money. It's to get out of the house. That's what you're doing. It's perfectly fine. Roberto's anti-golf is great. Coach, yesterday you sent me a message from the golf course. I didn't know you were playing. I thought you were just out there for a walk and recording. You were playing? playing? Yeah. Ah, cabrón. And I didn't miss a ball. I'm telling you. <laughs> hey, That's disappointing. I, that is disappointing hey, Roberto, for me. Roberto, but look. But, but I play golf gangster style. You know how that is? No, I don't stand in front of the ball and measure and swing. As soon as the ball's on the floor, I just swing. I don't waste my time doing the that I'm I'm gonna measure. No, no, no. As soon as I, as soon as they t- they taught me how to put those those uh, tees or whatever those palitos. <laughs> the ball, hey, I'm not I'm not gonna waste my time just doing this and swinging and then swinging. I see everybody in like. Are you going to hit it or not? And they're like, oh, you know, they're like, I see Toño, Polito, and Luis. They're like, they do like three or four, three or four swings before they get to the ball. Believe me, as soon as I put the ball, I take two steps back and I do a half of two or four. Hey, hey, I yellow is pedo. Vámonos. Like that. Hey, I hit the ball gangster style. I don't care. I'm not going to be wasting my time. No, you no. know what's incredible? He some said the, the palito. Fighters, the palito. Some, <laughs> of the, some of the greatest fighters that I've known or that I have grew up watching, not known, but play golf. You know, yeah. there's a story of uh, Joe Lewis Yeah. playing golf. Yeah. And I think he opened it up. And Sugar Ray Leonard. Oh, yeah, golf. he's good. Sugar Oscar Ray. is very good at golf. Miguel Cotto plays golf. Canelo plays golf. Now I'm seeing a lot of the younger fighters today all of a sudden following but golf. But you know, it's a, it's a, look. So now. And of course, other athletes from yeah, other, other sports. Other, but but uh, Canelo started 11 months ago and he's like excellent at it, what's going on. But he, golf is intimidating because it's a white man's sport. So if you go out there and you look, you're like, Fuck, I don't know how to behave. What, what do I wear? What do I do? What's going on? All that other stuff. But if you go with the right people, it's fun. Um, so I've always played, but I've never taken it serious. But during this pandemic, I'm like, you know, I'm going to start doing a little bit more. I went and bought new clubs, all that other stuff. But it's also expensive. 
you know, as coach, that's when you need a rich dad. Pasa Rico, right? <laughs> so, <Hey. coughs> and, and you know what? It is. It's usually waiting for the people to criticize you. Yeah. For example, I mean, look, Roberto, yesterday, I mean, if it was for me, I would have taken my work boots. Right? <laughs> no, 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 no. <laughs> no, no, I'm telling you. I mean, they tell me, hey, you want to go play golf? Vamos, así como estoy. Yeah. Así como estoy, I, I, yeah, I, yeah. I, I me fui. Uh, but if, uh, if I would have been working at, uh, at the building, I had my work boots and everything, right and, and they would have called me, you're going to come. I would have been like that. And then, yeah. Roberto, we're playing, and I shoot a couple of videos, and then right away, here comes the critics. Hey, tell him to take off his glove for putting. Oh, I said that. I said that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I go, <laughs> Roberto, I go like this. Hey, do you have to take off your glove for putting? What do you and mean? Like, what do you mean? I don't know that. What, what, All right, what do you so, mean? so when you putt, you take off. No, no. You're, but the thing is, your son knows better because I told him that. So what? when you putt, you take off your golf glove. That way you because can, it's soft. No, because that way you can feel the club, uh, the the grip. You want to have a much better grip. That way you can control it a little bit better. That way you, it's a better feel. So when you putt, so the glove is when you're gonna hit far. Yeah, but that way you and the and the putt you to take hit it off. Close. You want to oh. you want to feel because Puerto, you don't want to mess up. Your, me a glove. Boy, loan me a glove, and later on after he said that, I go, he told me to beat you one I am not even know. That's supposed to wear right but, now. But, but here's now the, and and I heard uh, Naid wanted to wear soccer gloves. Yeah, that, that because man. Because he got blisters. So, uh, so, the, uh, so he, uh, I, 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 was talk, I was sending messages with uh, Joel yesterday. I'm like, tell your son to take off the glove. I taught him better. Because that's why the Mexicans don't get invited. Because no se saben como portar. Who's saying, si saben como me pongo, pa que me evitan, right? That, that was it, right? You live on a country club. You got to know how to do that. So you got to know how to behave. So and you're right, because right now that they were playing, there was like there was like like I think it was like nine Mexicans in two golf carts, <laughs> and they were just riding around the course. Oh, my nose mucho. Si no era Volkswagen. Yeah, and they were. I'm telling you, oh like, nine, like nine, God, nine <laughs> Mexicans like nine, in one golf like cart. Nine Mexican guys. I mean, riding two cars. <laughs> and some of them were hanging on, on the top. Some of them were hanging on the top. Some of them were hanging on the top. Pensaron que era oh soldado, <laughs> parecía que era un bolcho. They thought they were in one. No. You remember? Roberto, Beto, you know what a bolcho is? Yeah, I I, I know what that is. Yeah, 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 yeah. Okay. But but here's the thing. They, How many Mexicans do you get in a bolcho? Yeah, well, like thirty-two. <laughs> okay, they thought it was a bolcho. <laughs> yeah, no, Roberto, I'm telling you. You see the golf cart? It parecen parecen guachos de Michoacán. Like they're all standing on the side, right? They're all, hey, they're, 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 they're hitting the ball. They're holes over here. <laughs> and the ball goes to the other side on the other on the other hole, and we're like, man. But that's the way it is, like he says. Yeah. You know, they don't they don't act properly. Yeah, that's why I, I can't hang out with you people. This is this is why. Uh, first of all, all you guys need to do is go buy Chicano Golf. Our good friend uh, Beto Gomez. Uh, there's a there's a company called Chicano Golf. I've seen them. I posted them on my uh, hold on. They're on my uh, my flask, and uh, they have their own golf balls. Good dude, Chicano Golf. Because there's nobody catering to the Mexican audience. But I'm going to take care of that in a couple of months. Anyway, that's another story. But no, we have fun doing it. We have a good outing. Uh, it's a fun. Couple, a couple of weeks ago, they had the celebrity uh, yeah. golf tournament in Tahoe. Yeah. Obviously, without fans. Oscar was there. Uh, Canelo. Curry. Curry. Steph Curry. Curry. Steph Curry was there. Curry. Um, a lot of, what was his name? The basketball player. Uh, Charles Barkley. A lot of people. Barkley. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Barkley was there. Steve Young. Yeah. Canelo. Yeah, there was so many celebrities out yeah, there. I it, mean, it's a, some of them are amazing yeah, golfers. But here's the thing: what I've noticed when you talk with athletes and like the golf, uh, we got on a different tangent, but it's perfect for boxers because they run in the morning, they take a nap, train in the afternoon for what, two good hours, then they got a lot of time to kill. It'd be good for them to just go to the drive range, something else, something different. It's a different thing because you can't. Yeah. It's something. Here's what I thought. Here's what I thought, and and I'm surprised because a boxer, to me personally, I think a boxer is impatient. Impatient. I am. I'm very impatient. Okay. You were a former fighter, and and you're in boxing, and a boxer goes into the ring. It's kill or be killed, or boy, no quiero. It's it's more adrenaline. However, what I've heard. Never outside of a mini golf when I was a little kid and go play mini golf. I'm hearing that a boxer will tell the Super Bowl winner, will tell the hockey winner, the baseball MVP. 
they get so much adrenaline to put that little ball in the hole. Mm -hmm. And they all say, I've been at the Super Bowl, but this is like more exciting. Yeah. I, I I can deal with the Super Bowl. I fought for the world title and won in front of thousands. This is more intense. It, it's challenging. I, yeah, it's, it's more challenging. It's a competitive edge, Roberto. It's, it's, it's the competitiveness a competitive of that edge. athlete. Yeah. yeah. And now they're in a different sport that they don't dominate. Yeah. That's, and they that, want to like, Robert, ah, you they just want said to it. like, you just yeah, said I dominate football. They can't I dominate dom boxing. Yeah. I dominate basketball. But I can't dominate this bolita. Oh, exactly. That's what it is, Roberto, because a boxer from the age of four or five, maybe in the crib, have trained to be the best. A baseball player says T-ball. Football player, football. Pop Warner. You put up, they start golfing, and you're like, how the hell is this 12-year-old girl beating me? The yeah. One of the, Miguel Cotto, who isn't the most conversational person. Great guy, but just doesn't talk. He's very shy. And I remember having a conversation with Cotto one time. Three, four words, that was it. I saw Cotto in Puerto Rico one time at a fight in a, uh, and he, Ponce. And Ponce. He's sitting on the floor on his iPad watching golf. And he's promoting the fight. He, you know, que esta mirando? Oh, el golf. So I start talking about golf. This is that. I had an hour long conversation with Miguel Cotto about golf. I'm like, why? He said, I can't win. I can't dominate. I can't master it. And it makes so me it's mad. that competitiveness yeah. that gets yeah. them upset that That's what I need to dominate. That, I've been, I'm accustomed to dominating my opponent. That's what it so is. So I need to get in and dominate you. And, yeah. And, yeah. And also, when, when you're golfing, and these guys are all millionaires, they're betting on every hole. And it, it can be the dumbest thing. Roberto, there's a thing called a, a par three, where it might be like 120 yards. You closest to the hole. We played, me, Razo, Eric Pineda, a couple weeks, last week. $5 closest to the hole. And you would have thought it was the Super Bowl. It was like, uh, yeah. but it was like, oh, ah, like we're just you don't five bucks. Yeah, because especially you don't want to lose the Razo. So it was like no problem. But it's just that edge right there of it. It's uh, it, I, Again, the competitiveness. It's like, yeah. uh, I'm going to beat you. Regardless if I'm good or not, I'm going to be better than you. And that's where I want to transition to where... As we wrap up the show, man, this has been a great show, by the way. Cheers to everybody else. And uh, here's my uh, Chicano Golf uh, right there. Chicano wow. Golf right there up wow. there. Yeah, so it's Chicano that Golf. Is... Yeah, so it's a good dude. He's doing uh, good stuff, bringing it but out there's there. there's a lot of other emblems there. What, what oh, is it? Well, I got, also got my West Side Boxing. I mean, West Side. Shout out to West Side. Uh, I got, side. I got, I got uh, Saludos to Juarez uh, Soccer Team. Uh, what else? I got oh, my, that's beautiful. My, my hey, that's, that's your friend Guru. No, no, no. That's my friend RC, the barber. <laughs> oh, 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 sorry, sorry, sorry. Pinche Guru. Hell no. Puro Team Nike. Eh, eh, hell no. No. Que Guru ni que nada. Que... No, 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 no. Puro Nike here, bro. Puro Nike. No. There are no Adidas Beto, here. I just want to shout out one quick shout out. No. To somebody that I've met not too long ago. And I met him through Joel Diaz. And I want to shout out to him. He means a lot to me as a friend, as a matchmaker, him as a manager, as a trainer. But somebody in the short period I've known him has become very, very close. I see him as family, as a great friend from many years to come. Sam Contreras. Oh, thank yeah. You for your message. He just sent me a beautiful text. Brother, love you and good things are coming i promise you yeah. Sam sammy is one of the, sammy is one of the greatest guys i've ever met in my life yeah man, man. that guy has a heart of gold i mean that guy well, you, you, i you think never, you introduced you, him to me yeah you never and went wrong with that guy we mm -hmm. managed uh caesar diaz who caesar passed diaz away a few years ago and or we promoted him and that was the first experience we had with him he now manages marlene esparza but in the short period that i've met him you know when there's genuine people. Yeah, good oh, yeah. dude. And this guy is one of the most genuine persons. He just sent me a beautiful text and shout out to him. Uh, Wait, he's watching? I, I don't know, yeah. but uh, I, I hope he is. I called him. I called him. Uh, well, actually, we we, we communicated in a couple, last week because his his son, his his son Sammy Junior. is training with Chocolatito. Uh, great little fighter. He, he he's sparring with Chocolatito here dude, in Coachella. Kid's like sixteen. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and he's sparring Chocolatito. He's been here for a few weeks already. He's Chocolatito's sparring partner. Great kid. 
I mean, just like his father. I mean, little Sammy, and I called I, I called Sam. I said, Sam, I know your son. Your son's over here. Anything he needs, you know, I'm just a call away. And you know, very yeah, very a uh, very great guy. Yeah, and if you're looking for a house in uh, Lake Matthews in Corona, Sam will hook you up. Does real estate. Great dude, man. Great guy. Great guy. Hector uh, Hexar says uh, just about this weekend. Amazing guy. He's just one of those nice, nice guys who's uh, genuine, genuine. Genuine. Yeah. And in boxing, it's hard to find genuine people. And, it is. And, and Sam it is. is a, he likes Antonio more than me, though, because. Oh, he's, he's, is he? Then forget him. Forget him. Forget him. And you, no, no, but he's good. He's good. If he likes my him, brother, then fine. Him and Antonio have. They, they have a, no, a, a long relationship. Yeah, good. Yeah, from amateurs and work amateurs. together and. and, and known each other but joel and antonio introduced him to me a few years back and i thank you for the introduction he's a great guy yeah great now, guy now uh, I, coach is having a shot oh my ira no mas ira no mas that's good tequila man it's yeah. really good hey, yeah. but he said he was drinking it with golden boy coconut water he forgot about the coconut yeah. hey, water coach oh. uh <laughs> <laughs> Coach, I, I just got a, a text message from uh, Inside Sources, BMZ, Bethel MZ. There's a picture of you with a 7-iron yesterday. I mean, Coach. Uh, oh, there you go. 7-iron. He Coach, said it. Well, let me tell you, let me tell you ask, ask Antonio yesterday. Uh, my son, we start playing, and he gives me two balls. He goes, hey, Dad, here. He gave me two Nike balls. He goes, don't lose them. I will mean, believe me. I got this. But, you know, it's just like Roberto says, when you have that competitive edge, and, and it's true, when you're about to hit the ball, to me, it just it just uh, annoys me a little bit when they're right there and they're in front of the ball, and they're like, you know, they're like, they're like practicing before they swing. I don't. As soon as I put the ball, mocos, I'm going to boom. And you know what? I, I, I started with two balls, and at the end of the, at the, end of the night, my son, my son goes, hey, you got the ball? I got six, mijo. <laughs> I never played golf before, but to me it was a win because I started with two balls and I ended up with six. So is that good? Hey, that's tranza. Uh, that's tranza. It's a Mexican golf course. Hey, hey, <laughs> but when you have... No, not Nike, no. He gave me two Nike balls and I ended up with... With some different balls. Yeah, I don't know they, what kind they, of they, they say oh, he had two Nike, he had two Adidas, he had two no, no. armor. <laughs> they say yeah, they're, armor. they're range balls. You're not supposed to pick up the exactly. range balls. No, you hey, don't pick boy. up the range. That's the drive your range was. And hey, I ended up with six. <laughs> and that's the I thing. Give them to my, I, I give them to my nephew. I go here so you can practice. Look, Oscar and Eric Gomez can go to the country clubs. We don't need all that. We don't want. Go with George Lopez to Pebble Beach. What You know what we need? Pinche Paisaville. That's what we need right there. That's all we got to do. All right. All right. Uh, man, this has been great tonight. Good energy. Good show. Um, but here's what I wanted to ask about this. The final question before we get to get going. <clears throat> Roberto, the most competitive person you've worked with. Because there's been a few. Because you talk about the golf. But there's some people who, especially the British guys, they don't want to lose in like gambling or cards or anything like that. Think about the most competitive people that you know. Where... You know, if you if you bet if you play quarters, say no Where if they have to walk out second, say no You know, though that's what makes boxers special, in my opinion, is that edge of nobody is gonna fuck with my brain right now. Nobody's gonna talk to me right now. I don't care what's going on. The boxers are like, oh, he's point two over. Ah, uh, the underwear fight. No, 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 take it off. You gotta have dealt with those people who are just uber competitive. That's a. That's a very good question, a very tough one. I think... Wait, hold on. Roberto, what happened in your backyard? All of a sudden, you have like a palm tree. Oh, I, that's my background. Se la robaron. It's not there. Hey, <laughs> they stole your palm tree. <laughs> you know, there's a lot of... Like, they took it to the golf course. Looting. There's a lot of looting going on, so I think oh, they the, took it. The golf course got them. <laughs> I, I can think of a couple people... As far as competitiveness, and I think, I mean, it's a it's a tough question because right out on the spot, Bernard Hopkins. Really, Biha? Bernard Hopkins. Not 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 so much as far as competitiveness of golf or this or that. Competitiveness of, in order to be a competitor, I think you have to be very disciplined. Mm. And as far as discipline, I don't think there's someone that I know in boxing 
and that's where I'm in the industry of as being more competitive than Bernard Hopkins. And really? why? Because he lived, he dreamt, he preached, he is boxing. Why? A lot of boxers think, I'm going to get ready, I'm going to train, I'm going to work out, I'm going to be in camp eight weeks from my fight. And once the fight's over, I'm on vacation. Bernard is not like that. Bernard is 24-7 dedicated to his sport. Mm. Bernard would gain five pounds <clears throat> in between fights and would start running. Bernard lost to Kovalev on a Saturday night, a fight that he lost clearly, and Monday he was back in the gym training. What? Why are you training? Why are you training two days after a loss if you're not going to fight soon? Why? I got to taper down from all those weeks of training so my body doesn't hurt, so my body gets back into, and because boxing is my life. Wow. So to me, the most competitive person I've ever met is Bernard Hopkins. Wow. Maybe, maybe there after him could be a De La Hoya. Oscar is very competitive um, as a fighter, as a promoter, as a person, as a somebody that's an avid golf player. And then I think Canelo. Canelo is very competitive. Really? The proof is he is uh, always challenging himself, always bettering himself, even though he's already at the top. He could, like, in most cases, most fighters would start falling away, like dropping and now he's playing golf, and he's playing golf and gets an instructor, and he's already at the celebrity golf tournament, Jeez. and he's already saying, okay, I, I placed in this level. Next year, I'm going to be 10 times better, and I'm going to – he's the competitor. Whether it's playing cards, whether it's betting, whether whatever it is, he's a very – and I think that comes from boxing. Is it Mayweather like that too? I don't know him that well personally. Oh, okay. I've heard Mayweather just hates anything because well he he gambles a lot. So I've heard some of the gambling people tell him like he gets pissed off about because Mayweather, from what I've heard, <clears throat> will gamble first quarter of football games, the first half. And I'm like, damn, and he like that's a different level right there. But hey, whatever, coach. For you, some of the people who are just so that you've dealt with that are just like. Uber competitive. I only know one guy. Honestly, I only know one guy that was crazy, crazy obsessed with competition, and he never liked to lose. And not only he was obsessed with uh, being such competitive, but he will back it up. And I've seen him personally. Omar Figueroa. Really? A, Omar Figueroa is a crazy guy. Omar Figueroa, you see him? I mean... Looks are deceiving with that guy. When he was training with me, I, I was training a, a guy from Mississippi, a kid that was that played college basketball. Omar played basketball, but I mean high school, whatever. He's like five but, six. Exactly. And I was training this kid from Mississippi that played college, college, almost going into pro basketball. And one day we're in the gym, and it's one of those days where I tell him, "Hey, we're not gonna train today. Let's go play basketball." So we're playing basketball, and things start getting a little heated between them two. And they play a one-on-one, -on -one and he beats him. Omar beats him on a one-on-one. -on -one. And then all of a sudden, Omar Figueroa starts going to, to the bowling alley in Fantasy Springs. When he, at one point, he comes to camp, and he says, Coach, there's nothing to do. I said, boxing. Yeah, but when, you know, when I'm at the gym, I'm not running. I'm in, in the afternoon. I have nothing to do. So then my son, my son started bringing Omar to the, to the bowling alley. And he started getting the hang of bowling. And he goes, hey, I'm going to be good at what I do. He went and bought himself a whole set. He bought shoes. No! He bought everything. At one point, I don't know much about bowling, but him and my son got so good at it that Omar, at one point, he got a perfect game. I don't know what a perfect game is because he got <laughs> the pictures. He showed me the pictures of the screen with his name on the perfect game. Where all of it was strikes. 
That's what, that's a perfect game, coach. Well, that, I don't know. <laughs> I mean, every, on the whole game, he had like a perfect game. And that was not only once, a few times. Yeah. And him and Joel would compete against each other to see who, who would get the best score. And I'm telling you, I've never seen – I've seen a lot of people – they like competition, and you know they 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 gamble quarters, dollars, whatever. But I've never seen anybody that is as competitive and obsessed with competition as Omar Figueroa. That that's. So let me add to that. I didn't know, obviously, about Omar right there. Coach said earlier that he went and sparred with Valero, mm-hmm. right? right? He said it a little a, a few minutes ago yeah. about him sparring with Valero. And so when Omar's dad called me. And said they want us to spar with Valero. The first thing I told Omar's dad is no. Mm. It's not happening. It's not happening. And Omar's dad wow. said, Why? Valero's not a sparring partner. He doesn't know how to spar. He was Valero a champion at the time? Valero was gonna fight Antonio De Marco, who was a southpaw, <clears throat> and they wanted they wanted Omar to spar with him. And Omar was I think eighteen years old. He was yeah. still a baby. We had just signed him, or maybe 19. I mean, he was a baby, no more than 20. And I said, no, Omar, don't do it. To the father. Yeah. A couple of days later, maybe a week later, they went without my blessings. I didn't send them. I didn't send them. And Omar's dad calls me, and he says, Roberto, you were right. Valero doesn't hold back. So I said, you went? I told you not to go. He says, yeah, well, we came. And you're right. He comes out 150% to fight. And he hurt Omar. So my reaction right away was, te lo dije. Is he okay? Oh, no, no, no. He's okay. He got hurt. And I told him, let's stop because of what I, I had already told the dad. And the dad's already probably thinking, este es un animal, te, te va a lastimar. So he tried to stop it. Just like Joel said. Mm-hmm. I didn't know he came back crying or, or hurt. <clears throat> but Omar said, no. I'm going to get him back. Damn. And Omar went and did whatever he did. They moved Omar from like number three sparring partner to the number one sparring partner. Valero loved him. A couple of days later, I called him back and I said, hey, are you guys home? No, they actually moved us to number one. And guess what? They're inviting us to the fight. <laughs> yeah. Is he still there? <clears throat> oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. We've been sparring and we've been... Hey, lo va a lastimar, cabrón. Es, tienes un pollito todavía. He was a baby. He hadn't won a world title. He was still a baby. 18. Mm-hmm. 18 or 19. I mean, he was still super young. Yeah. I ain't 20 yet. Valero loved him so much. Invited him to Monterrey to the fight. Got him seats. Got him... At- Om, I didn't know he was that competitive, but I do remember a couple stories. Julio Diaz was going to spar him. Sorry, Julio Diaz was going to spar him one day. The, baby, the into baby bull? No, Julio, Joel's My brother. brother. Oh, your brother. <laughs> and, Joel, and Julio walking into the gym said, Hey, cabrón, they're walking in together. Hoy te voy a meter tus putazos, huh? And Omar says, Cool. Cool. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> cool, yeah. I, I want to feel what it is. Now, it gets it gets crazier. Yeah. I think he told you or told me, I want to know what it is to get cut. Yeah, I want to gotta... know what it is to get dropped. Yeah. <clears throat> I want to know what it is to get hurt, like I hurt my opponents. Yeah. This kid, when he won the world title against... Uh, Arakawa. Arakawa. In San Antonio, it was an amazing fight. They could barely take off the gloves off his hands. Joel was barely pulling him out, and he was in pain. He had broken both his hands. No. And, and he had a cut on the, on the bridge of the nose. There was blood all over. As a matter of fact, he still has his shorts and his shoes full of blood. I mean, the way the way he finished the fight with the shorts and, 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 and the shoes, he has them. He enjoys having those shorts and those shoes. Full of blood wow. up to this day. Now, this is a kid, Beto, that even after he left Golden Boy and, and moved on, uh, Lucas Matisse won the world title. We were having dinner. 
here in LA with Lucas, the team, Coach Joel. I'm having dinner at a at, at the at the table eating, and I turn around, and I'm like, "Who's next to me?" And Malbec. And Malbec, and I'm like, "Oh shit, it's Omar! What the? Who, what are you doing here, Colorado? I, I haven't <laughs> seen you. I didn't even know he was there." Oh, it's que- and he was quiet. And Coach Membito, and I'm like, "All right, well." I got up. They were already talking about him fighting Broner. <coughs> I think everybody had a little speech that night and get up and talk and then this and that. And I said, Omar, get up and talk. You're fighting Broner. That's a fight I always, always wanted for Omar. They were both with Golden Boy at the time. Even before Broner lost to Maidana, that's the fight I wanted for him. And he said, Robert, this is a fight I know you've always wanted. Robert, I'm going to dedicate this fight. I'm going to knock him out for you. And you know what? He would have oh. knocked out Broner. He would have knocked out Broner. Yeah. The fight never happened. But Omar had the style Oof. of walking <laughs> through fire, which Broner wasn't, wasn't going to give him fire, but would have walked through fire or hell and would have knocked out. And that's the fight I wanted for Omar because I said, this is the fight. That's going to bring you to a level where everybody in the world is going to love you. Obviously, they never get in the fight. Yeah. It's, I, I, at, one, at one point, at one point, Beto, we were sparring. It was April 1st. It was April 1st. And, uh, hold, 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 before you say that, normally about two hours, we cut off the show. But fuck, the stories are so good tonight. I'm going to have another drink. So, Absolutely. So, so we're, we're, yeah, I'm going to make me another drink with Rayito. There you go. We're making up for last year. Last week you said you only did one hour, cabron. Well, but, well it's because it's because Razo. Okay, Raza. so let's go to three hours today. Ah, cabron, Calvado, Joe Rogan, Mexican. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> All right, hold on, go, go. Right, uh, Roberto. Roberto's calling me. Hey, Joel, how's Omar doing? He's doing good. He's sparring. It was, it was close to one of his fights. It was April first, and as soon as we walk in. Oh yeah, yeah. Oh, April Fool's. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Omar tells me, "Hey, coach, let's play a let's play a joke on, on Robert." Yeah, oh, what yeah. Do you think? Hey, right now when I finish sparring, tell Robert, call Robert and tell me. Hey, I don't know, but something happened to Omar. He got cut. I go, okay, let's do it. So he starts. But sparring. this is before they sparred. Before they sparred. Yeah. Before sparring, he's telling me to after sparring after the sparring session. To call Roberto and tell him, hey, Roberto, oh, excuse me, Omar got cut and something's happening. I mean, he, he probably not, he's probably not going to fight. Actually, it was before the Aracagua fight. Yeah. Yeah. So, Omar, Omar sparring, second round, Antonio tells me, hey, Omar's cut. I go, no. So, Omar turns and sure, his nose is cut in half. Oh, for real? For real, for real? Yeah, for yeah. Real. They were going to play a joke on me, but the joke fucking against... joke was on them. Yeah. Roberto, yeah, we froze. <laughs> we were trying to play a joke on Roberto, and the joke backfired on us. Fuck. Now we stopped the sparring, and Omar is like, man. He's like, oh, I'm not going to fight. I go, hey, let me, see what, let me see what I can do right now. So I started working on the cut. So we were trying to make a joke on Roberto, and it backfired <laughs> on us that day. I said we're never gonna play any jokes anymore. So we are not allowed. We are not allowed to play April Fool jokes on yeah. anybody. Anymore. <laughs> From now on, Coach Joel closes the gym on April Fools on April first. Hey, it's no joke it's, no more. It's our, it's, it's our only day off of the year. April Fool's Day. It, 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 that's why we do the Thursdays. That's why we have so much fun with it. Because oh look, Joe Ash said I'm gonna pop over another Guinness. Chicano Golf, our good friend was. Uh, and again, it's Ricky's favorite beer. No. Absolutely, Ricky's favorite beer. The first trip I do to Manchester, he's not going to fight. It was for a press conference or something. He goes, come on, let's go out and drink. Oh, uh, no. Yeah, you're going to drink. He goes, let's drink Guinness. I've never had a Guinness in my life. But over there, it's different. Yeah, it's warm. It, it's No, no, not warm, but it's very thick. Here you buy it in the can. And he mm-hmm. even tells me you have to buy it in the bottle, which has a, a little marble inside. I don't know what the oh, marble. Oh yeah, maybe... no, it makes that noise. I've had a, a body tint. It makes that. It's like a spray for all you taggers. And it's like the spray, spray can. <laughs> <laughs> but that little marble, I guess, it, like breaks up the yeah. thickness. Yes. So when you pour it, it's not a stick. So 
over there without the marble, it's thick. I think I had like four. Chingasu, so no! Full. I was so full, so thick. And Ricky's telling me, Robert, this is the only beer that has iron. That's why I drink so much. So like, pinche frijoles get iron too? What the hell? <laughs> but beer normally doesn't have iron, cabrón. So, he's at 20, and I'm at six. Wait, 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 whoa, 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 whoa. 20 beers? Beers, beers. And I'm at six. And I'm like, oh. Wait, wait, wait. Who bro? Yeah, no puedo, Ricky. Wait, goes, Rick, on, one Ricky, more, one more. Ricky had 20 Guinness? We went three days in a row, and I was ready to come home. Ya estaba tirando la toalla. Ya no puedo con Ricky. I didn't want to hang out with Ricky. I was avoiding Ricky, hiding. I get to my room after three days in my hotel room. I haven't seen my room for three days. I get yeah. to my room, and I said, finally, I'm going to go to sleep. I go to sleep, and the phone rings in my room. Who's calling me in my room? I answer. There's only I'm one right. Ricky Hatton. <laughs> I'm downstairs in the bar. Can you come down? Oh. So I go down. I go down. Check this out. This is crazy. Wait, wait. Hold, 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 hold. You've done three-day bender with Ricky Hatton where he's drinking 20 Guinness a day. No, no, no. 20 to start in the afternoon. Afternoon? Yeah, yeah, yeah. 20 to start in the afternoon. So check this out. I leave one night and I sleep over his brother's house, Matthew. The next morning is Sunday morning, uh, have breakfast, and I said, hey, uh, it's been Friday, Saturday, it's Sunday now, can I just go back to my hotel? <laughs> Take a break. His wife drives me to the hotel, drops me off. Like, Take me. <laughs> I, wanna, I just want to go back to the California, I want to sleep for a week. Un aguachile, uno, unos aguachiles, por favor, un tortilla. There's no, there's no aguachile over there, so I want to go home, I want to go back to LA. I lay down, I haven't laid down for five minutes when the phone in my room, not myself, my phone in my room rings. Now, remember, last night I slept at his brother's house. Ricky's fiance, Ricky's wife at the time shows up, sees me having dinner that night. Hey, are you going out tonight? No, we're going to stay here. I'm, I'm sleeping over. She leaves. Next morning, Ricky calls me. I, when the phone rings, I, I answer. Hey, I'm down here in the bar, the hotel bar. Oh, my God. No. <laughs> Come down. Come down. Uh, I didn't even put my clothes back on. I go run down. He's at the bar. <laughs> and he tells me, I got a problem. I got a problem. If anybody asks, I slept here with you. I, oh. I, I spent the night here at the hotel with you. We went out last night and I, I spent the night here because I didn't go home last night. And I said, okay. Hey, Rick, there's one problem. He goes, what's that? Jennifer knows that I spent the night at Matthew, so how did you spend the night here with me? Oh, oh shit. And he goes, bartender, one more. <laughs> there's only he's one, one Ricky Hatton. Said, there's only one, one Ricky Hatton. Wow. So we continued that night. As, I think uh, I, I, don't, I don't know how I made it home, but I made it home. Venom Sound 84. Cheers. These stories are awesome. Uh, Beto Gomez, my, you're half Irish after that night. Uh, also, oh yeah, he is. Also, Yahweh, come Edgar, Yahweh. Up. <laughs> <laughs> wow, Roberto. Wow, there, there's just there's just no need for any of that. So, oh my goodness, there has to be my wow. How do you get going after this? Oh my goodness. What? Okay. All right. This is the final, final story because Roberto cig Cigar is almost done. There's a, uh, because we've been going on the British, uh, uh, Joel, I want you to think about this too. The celebrities that you met with the British world or the European world that you're just like, what am I doing talking to these people? Roberto, for you, I know it was Oasis. 
Right? Yes. Leo. That was amazing. Gallagher. That was amazing. Oasis, uh, for anybody who knows him, one of the greatest greatest bands uh, in England. Um, outside of the Beatles, I think probably the second greatest band ever. There's a uh, bad blood between the both brothers, Liam and Gallagher. And uh, you could never get a picture of them together because they don't get along. And I didn't know that. I just knew they were both from Manchester. They were from mm -hmm. a group. And they were great friends of Ricky Hatton. For the fight with Ricky and Polly Malanaji, Ricky invites them. We're in the dressing room. And I've, I've heard of Oasis because when Ricky trained in the gym or when he trained, when he was working out, Oasis was always playing. So I'm now like, oh, shit, that's Oasis. That's the lead singer, the player, oh, man, the, the, the band. So, and I've heard of their music. So I'm like, hey, can I get a picture with you to one of the brothers? I said, yeah, 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 yeah. But I never said, can I get a picture with you and your brother? Mm -hmm. So then I went to the other one and I said, hey, can I get a picture with you? Yeah, yeah, of course. But I didn't know there was bad blood between the brothers. In fact, the, the group broke up because they don't like each other. Somehow, when the picture was getting ready to be taken, I already had the photographer, hey, I'm going to get a picture with them. Can you get ready? And then, hey, you ready for the picture? You ready for me? Yeah, yeah. Okay. Boom. The picture's taken, and I'm with both brothers. To this date, the picture's yeah. hanging on the wall here at the house, and people are like, hey, but don't. now, they, now. Yeah, they course, hate each other. Them. <laughs> now I tell them, this is a unique picture yeah. because you will not get a picture of them together. Yeah. Ricky Hatton, who was friends of them, had a guitar, gave it to one of the brothers to sign, then went to the other brother and said, hey, sign my guitar. And the guitar was with them for like six months before the brother signed it. Fuck. Once he signed it, he signed the back. So that his signature wouldn't be <laughs> where the other brother signed. So it, it sort of doesn't help because when you want to show off the guitar, you got to show off both sides. Yeah. But that's how much they, there was a dislike. It's sad, mm -hmm. but it's true. Yeah. Mm -hmm. See, if they were Mexican, nah, it wouldn't happen. Their mom would have their, their hit them. They hit there. Oh, they would have fought. Yeah, they would have fought. Coach, imagine if uh, Tonyo would have talked to you. Oh, believe me. I'll drag him over here. He'll talk to me. <laughs> Hey, all right, so actually, the, actually, Antonio and I uh, didn't talk for a while. No way. Yeah, there was a time, and and he fought. Actually, you know what? When he fought the second fight with Cañonero Quiroz, because he beat Quiroz the first time. And the second time that he I fought didn't Quiroz, know that. I didn't know that. Yeah, Antonio and I didn't talk for about a year. Oh. Yeah, we were like, well, we were mad. Hey, Antonio's not watching, so go ahead, say whatever you want. No, no, no. Seriously, it, it was like. I mean, we had some family, some family problems, and then I was a little upset at, at, at everybody, so I stepped away and I didn't talk. I mean, I wasn't mad at Antonio personally, but I was basic, I was, I was like a little disappointed at the family, so I stepped aside for I think it was about a year, but I was still like watching what they were doing, and and even though, but there was nothing directly with Antonio. Yeah, yeah, yeah communicating yeah and uh, i left coachella i wasn't training with them no more uh you were still active yeah yeah so i i moved away antonio was training over there julio was training over coachella and all of a sudden antonio gets the rematch with cañonero quiroz and i remember I like i'm not training him because i was training antonio through, i mean after i retired so i said okay if you guys want to deal with that you guys do your own I'm, I'm moving away. So for one year, I have no communication with him. And then the Cañonero Quiroz rematch came. And all of a sudden, people calling me, hey, is your brother training? I said, yeah, I think so. Because they, they knew that I would always train my brother. And then they're like, hey, Cañonero Quiroz is working really hard. Porque se quiere sacar la espina, you know, from the first fight. All right, you know, it's fine. Cañonero really wants it. He really wants it. Long story short, when Antonio fought him, 
when Antonio fue a Cañonero Quiroz, uh, Antonio went. He went with Espinosa and everybody else. And I drove, I drove to Vegas uh, on my own with a couple of friends. And we bought our ticket to the fight and we sat, we sat on the, on the, uh, I mean, on the audience. And we're watching the fight and Pumi gets hurt. He gets hurt really bad in the early in the fight. But the first yeah. fight you weren't with him? No, the first fight I was with him. Oh, okay. The first fight the you first trained fight, him, yeah. you prepared him. Okay, okay, okay. Yeah, the first fight I was with him. The okay. second fight I wasn't. Mm -hmm. So then in the second fight, I still remember because we were sitting we were sitting in the audience. And I see that he's fighting and he gets hurt by Kiros. And when he gets hurt, he was hurt to the point where the fight should have been stopped right there. But the referee let him go. And he kept going. And he started doing better. I think it was the fourth round. He started getting better and better and better. And then in the ninth round, it was towards the end of the fight. He gets hurt again. But he wasn't as hurt as he got hurt early in the fight. So then all of a sudden, the corner gets in there and stops the fight. So as soon as he gets out, you know, okay, my brother, whatever. I went to him. I went to him. I went from the audience. I went to him and I said, hey. You haven't talked to him, though, in a year uh -huh. at that point. Uh -huh. At that point? That was the yeah. first time talking to him. That was the first time talking to Antonio after we we didn't talk for a while. Wow. So I went to him and I said, man, and I was mad. I was mad at the way things happened. I was mad at the team. I said, man, he wasn't as hurt. He wasn't as hurt at this point. You guys should have let you guys should have let him go and finish the fight. If you guys wanted to stop the fight, you guys should have stopped the one. He really got hurt early in the fight. Lo vean de ver how cerrar con broche de oro at least finish his fight because mm -hmm. he wasn't mm -hmm. as hurt. They stopped the fight when they weren't supposed to. They should have stopped it earlier. Mm -hmm. So then Antonio was like, yeah, I understand. But Antonio's eyes were shut, Roberto. Both eyes were shut. He couldn't see. And I remember they took him to the hospital and I went with him. And going to the hospital, they had they had him and Quiroz in the same room, two different beds, and they're talking to each other. No so, way. Yeah, it was, uh, it was, they were in the hospital, same room, in two different beds. I mean, all we do is open up the curtain that divided the two beds, and they were talking <laughs> to each other. No, Antonio's eyes were shut. Hey, the then, second fight, was that at uh, Thomas and Mac under Chavez and Oscar? First one. That was the which first one, one. Which one was the first one? The first one was when Antonio fought Quiroz and uh, Chavez de la Hoya. Okay, one. so in the first one, after the fight, I'm at the Caesars in a, in one of the bars, and I see Antonio walking by. I think he had a, a little shiner, mm -hmm. but that's the one he won. Mm -hmm. And I went over to Antonio, can I get a picture? I have a picture with Antonio. No way. After, yeah, I have a picture with Antonio. I, I remember getting out of the bar. It was at Caesars Palace. Mm -hmm. uh, the fight was at Thomas and Mac, but yes. the host hotel was Caesars. Yeah, and I remember seeing Antonio walking outside of the the bar, and I ran over and I took a picture with him. The first, the first one, no he had a way. shiner. Mm -hmm. But the second one, where was the fight? The I think it was at the Plaza, Old Town, Old Town Las Vegas, downtown Vegas. Yeah, downtown. Okay, Vegas. I wasn't there. No. So after the fight, they they're in the hospital, and him and Quiroz were in the same room. I mean, different. I mean. Next, to, uh, right there next to each other. So when they released him, I remember Antonio felt really bad, and uh, you know, just going back, I went with two of my friends to Vegas to watch his fight. And after the fight, I come to him, I start talking to him, and you know, after they released him from the hospital, I asked him, I said, "You want to stay, or you want to go?" Because we didn't have a room. We didn't have a room to stay that night. You guys were coming back home. We were just coming back home. Yeah. Everybody else was staying. They're coming the yeah. next day, and he goes, ah, "I want to go." So he came with us. I remember that we we got on the freeway and we got on the on, on the 15 before we even got to uh, to Gene over there on, on uh, Vegas. Before we even got to to uh, a, pr a prim, pulled over. Uh, he wanted to go to the bathroom, so we pulled over on the side of the road. And I remember he couldn't he couldn't open his eyes, and he just broke down. He just broke down, and he just. He just told me that he wasn't feeling well, and you know it was like you know what, just don't cry about it. You know, hey, shake it off and let's go. But it was it was a sad moment after 
we didn't talk for a whole year. That the reunited was in a in a moment like that. Yeah. And, and see, and that's just, Beto. That's wow. the that's the thing that the fans that are listening. Yeah. They 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 see the fighters win. They see the fighters celebrate. They see the glory. But they also got to understand that in the down moment. Yeah. Listen, listen to what Joel's saying. Where was the corner? Where was the team? Where was the fans? Where were the Antonio supporters? Yeah. Antonio drove back. Drove back. Instead of flying back, yeah. he, he drove back solito. Mm -hmm. It's a very lonely sport mm -hmm. when is. you're down. It's yeah. a very lonely. Te quedas. Who's going to suffer when you lose? Yeah. Only that guy, that fighter. It's uh... in, in this sport, you see some, some really sad moments. I've been to fights. I've been to fights. Honestly, some of the saddest moments that, that are, they're unforgettable. I'm not gonna mention names, but I've been to fights where I'm in the dressing room helping a fighter as a cut man, and the fighter supposed to be a, a prospect, and he loses. He loses. We come back to the corner. Not even his. Not even his trainers with him. It's just me and him. Wow. And then when he's looking around, nobody's in the dressing room with him. And as soon as as soon as he gets dressed and everything, we walk out looking for his team. Nobody's nobody's there to be found. Uh, everybody's gone. It's just me and him. I've been situations where I've taken I, I've held fighters in the corner as cut men, and after the fight, not even his his trainers are around him because he he lost the fight, and everybody leaves and they leave him behind. So I'm right there trying to just keep him motivated one way or another. Wow. You know? I, I, I know of one case with one of the our heroes, Julio Cesar Chavez, after he had been huge, he lost a fight that he wasn't supposed to lose. And after the fight, family, team, corner, management, everybody, nobody was there. Come on, for Chavez? Yeah. I think that it was with... Uh, Willie Weiss, he lost to a guy he wasn't supposed to lose. I think it was Willie Weiss, who was nobody special. Maybe Julio didn't, I mean, most likely Julio didn't train, yeah. didn't prepare. No. And he loses. And Julio was always used to every time he won, no joke, he didn't even stay at hotels. He didn't even stay at the host hotel. He had a... A couple of times he stayed off the strip at these apartments, uh, Alexis Park Resort, I think it was called. Alexis Park in Vegas? Yeah, it's right across the street from the, from hard, the rock. hard Rock. Yeah, 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 yeah. Wow. But it was apartments, like little apartments. Yeah, it's like those Holiday Inn where, like, those, like, where you have a kitchen and everything else. Yeah, 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 exactly. He's, wait, That's where Julio would stay because at the hotel. You can't go down to the lobby. Everybody's waiting for you. So he was off the at strip. Alexis Park. Ugh. Alexis Park Resort. He thought he stayed there a couple times. Uh, he was comfortable there. He was alone there. It was like apartments. And I was there after some of his wins for celebrations. And if there was not a hundred people. There wasn't anybody there. I mean, it was wow. on the balcony, on the balcony, all over. There was all the rooms connect. Like, yeah. Again, it's apartments. Everybody's partying, drinking. The room's full. You go get your beer. Yeah, drink, I can take see that. Okay. The balcony. And when he lost against Willie Weiss, I wasn't there. I don't even remember where the fight was. It I, was I, at I the, think it was. All right, so here Hilton. it is. The Hilton Hotel, October yeah, yeah, yeah. 2nd, 1999. Uh, Chavez <laughs> against Willie Weiss. He lost unanimous decision. 97, 93, 99, 91, 98, 92. Not even close. Not even close. And Willie Weiss never did anything after. Willie Weiss. I think, I think even Junior might have come back years later and beat him. I Willie was 23 and 6 at the time. And you uh, yeah. No, Chavez came back and beat and knocked him out in 2003, second round, and Willie never fought after that. Okay. So when he lost to Willie Weiss, I'm at home. I'm in San Diego, and I felt so, because I thought, okay, the hero, he's a mm -hmm. champ. And I called a couple people that were close to him. 
And they said, no, 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 we left them alone. Now, for one part, you think they're doing the right thing because he's upset, he lost, we're leaving him alone. But for Julio, later I found out, he was upset because, ah, ahora que perdí, now that I lost, nobody wants to be with me. Yeah. Everybody's out on their own. Mm-hmm. But that's how the fighter feels it. They thought they were giving him space to say, shit, you know, let's give him a space. He's upset. He, let's go over here. Let's go celebrate because we're here, maybe in Vegas, party, and he's not going to want to. But he felt the opposite. Mm-hmm. Now that I lost, you guys abandoned me. And and it was sad because that's boxing. When you're up, everybody wants to be with yeah. the winner. When you're down, everybody wants to. They were probably with Willie Weiss. <laughs> <laughs> My Roberto, look, when, when, when my brother Julio fought Kendall Holt, it was also a very sad story because Julio, at that point, to me, was a great fighter, very technical, a lot of potential. And honestly, I didn't, I, I didn't, see, I didn't see Kendall Holt beating my brother Julio, honestly. I remember uh, we were at the Chumash Casino in Santa Ines. Yeah. So we're in the dressing room, Roberto. And they had, they had a nice couch. And, you know, right there, they were really famous for music, concerts and stuff. And uh, the room where, we're, where we were in, the dressing room, you know, like every, every promoter, they put lights, you know, those, those standing lights. And then they got the banner for, you know, anybody comes in with the cameras and stuff. So Julio, Julio lays on the couch. He sits on the couch and he puts his head against the wall. And above him... It was a big old picture frame, Roberto. A big picture frame that was really thick, I still remember. And all of a sudden, the cameras come in, and they're trying to record Julio, what he was doing. You know, usually yeah. a camera crew comes in before the fight, and they do a little video of him. So these guys are moving things around. Somehow, they hit Se the guy, and the frame comes down on Julio's head, Roberto. Bah, like, wow. full force. Julio's head was leaning on the, on, on the, on the wall, and the frame just came straight down on, on the wall. And Julio, like, he almost passed out. That's, I mean, came full force. And you're talking about a little bit of time with him getting ready to go go fight. Julio never recovered. Never recovered because he had a big old bump on the head. And he wasn't feeling well. His head was hurting. And he, wow. still, and he still fought like that. He still fought like that. He lost to Kendall Holt. And after the fight, it was like, he was still he wasn't still feeling he wasn't feeling well after that. I mean the frame was big. It was heavy. And that thing just came down and hit him right in the head. And trying to, you know, convince him to hey, are you okay? He's on fire. Ah. Push it through. I mean, after the fight, he still had he still had a big old bump right here. And he was feeling dizzy through the whole through the whole time we were in the dressing room. I, a lot, a, a lot, a lot, of things happen behind the scenes. Yeah, that people don't know. And that's why right, right now we we've gone for two hours, eighteen minutes, and everybody that started with us are still with us because the stories that we tell are so not not, not we that you gentlemen tell are so good, and we keep on going and keep on flowing and keep on vibing. I, told, I saw I saw a fight. Man. I didn't I didn't see the fight. I saw clips of a fight the other night. I don't even know where it was from. It was two women fighting. Recently, recently, I, I don't know where it was from. Maybe the listeners will know. There was so many rabbit punches oh. in that fight. Was it the, the zone show they had recently? The women fight? The one there was two women fighting. Yeah. In England. Yeah. In England? Yeah. Or Australia? Somewhere. Oh, Austra- Australia. Where... Australia. Australia. Okay. There were so many rabbit punches. Yeah. That ref to me, and I don't know the referee, and my respects to all officials that are in there because they have a tough job. He should never referee another fight again, because hopefully the two women are are fine, yeah. but there could be an incident because of that, of a bad night for the referee, whatever you want to call it, mm-hmm. that those two women could be in the hospital dead, or with effects because with serious injuries, yeah. That, the skull is here. Back here, there's no protection. But there's still brain. Yeah. Those punches there, 
it's been proven. That's why it's illegal to hit rubber punches. And you know what? The first one, hey, next one, I'm going to take a point. After that, I'm going to disqualify you yeah, guys. It's, it's yeah. But that, that little clip that I saw was both of them. Like, hitting each other? Hitting yeah. each other in the back. But the referee, you see him like he lost control of the fight. That should, as, you know, if a fighter test is positive, if a pi, if a fighter does DQ, if it, I mean, yeah, they're suspended. They're the, it should be applied to anybody in boxing, anybody. It's uh, it's that it, goes for everybody else. Yeah, it, I saw, I saw the same tweet. I think you saw the same tweet account that came through where you're like, what the heck is going on with this? But my goodness, it's uh. It's been another good edition of Thurs Diaz. It's a uh, man. Normally we do, yeah. I, I, Sulem said uh, on the Tim Zoo card against Jeff Horn. It was the fight before that. You're right. Australia. Uh, yeah, 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 yeah. Shannon O'Connell. That's the that was the fight. Thanks, Sulem, mm-hmm. as always for appreciating. Thank you, Sulem. By the way, Sulem's oh. next fight. I got it down, and I'll announce it. I don't have a date, but Sulem requested something, and right here I'm going to tell her right now. Joel recommended that I work with Sulem. Joel, once again, like with Sam, thank you. An amazing fighter, yeah. an amazing young lady, a tremendous uh, motivation for boxing. Mm-hmm. Athlete. Big, big things are coming for her. She asked for one fight. The other day she texted me, she sent me a message. Mm-hmm. I'd like to fight this person. I reached out. As soon as I have a date, Lulu Juarez is yours, Sulem. Let's go You're kick in. some ass. Barbie Juarez is sister. Let's go do it. I talked to uh, Promociones del Pueblo a couple days ago. Let's go do it. That's that's your next fight. We're going to do a WBC belt, and I think she's in. And Sulem, let's go kick some ass. There is the opportunity. Now it's time to take advantage of it. Absolutely. Um. Wow. <laughs> hey, by the way, said Marlene, Marlene wow. is, uh, coming up on uh, her next fight. Wow! And uh, Franchon, she's gonna have a date soon. Um, so you're gonna and, do that all women's card in October? It, look, look, I, I was very hesitant with women boxing. I didn't know it. Today, two years later, I'm probably one of the biggest fans. And I'm going to push women's boxing more than anybody else because they are ready to fight. Mm-hmm. They are not saying, oh, he's muy, está muy alto. Oh, está muy rápido. <laughs> está muy oh, alto. Oh, I don't even these that. girls want to fight. These women, these ladies want to fight. I thank the WBC because there's no more the women's belt and the ma- it's the belt, the champion's belt. Dun, dun, dun! Breaking news on Thursday is Sulem Urbina fighting for a world title. <laughs> dun, dun, dun! Great review, subscribe, let and, us know. And Senecia's next fight will be for the world title against Anabel Ortiz. You heard it here first on Thursdays. It's going to be some very good moments now. We're going to, look. Wow! Women's boxing is the best it's ever been in the U.S. It is. It really is. Have you worked that long time? Have you worked that fight in Tulsa and seen us the breakus and the way she handles herself professionally? They're on the right. And I'll tell you this, Roberto, as a reporter for the last six years working with Golden Boy and Matchroom Thompson, when you deal with the women, they are vicious. They are to the point, and they will call out anybody. Love that and respect to them. And Brekus, Brekus, I, I, am I pronouncing it right? Yeah, Brekus. Yeah. Okay, yeah. Brekus. Did you see Pro when she lost? Class. The class? Yes. Very men, classy. Men need to learn yeah, from that. women boxing yeah. to be classy. You lose? Hey, congratulations. I, how about, take care of the I, I'll take one more, one level above that. Brekus. How about take a note from her and say, I'll fight anybody anywhere. She didn't have exactly. to, she didn't have to fight that girl who was dangerous, and she did. She risked her perfect record. Anyways, no, no, I gotta sit a little way, but let's fucking go. Drink your drink. 
Let's fucking go. It's Thursday is. We're having a good time. And I'm not sleepy. I just got to go edit for the next two hours as to Bad upload the podcast. Man, you're still talking. <laughs> you let me from another hour from last week. But, but you I owe us. This. All right. I will say this. There's a lot of great women boxing. Mm-hmm. Just like there is men. There's not a better women stable of boxing. And I'll tell that to everybody out there. Than the Golden Girls. Okay? You got Senicia, you got Marlene, you got Sulem, you got Franchon. There's not a better group out there. Yeah. And I'll tell any promoter out there, you think you have better fighters? Let's match them. Let's uh-huh. do it. I got I got four women ready to challenge your four women. Let's do it. Yeah, it's it's like when I talk to Roberto and, and I always tell all these, <laughs> all these athletes, all these athletes, all these fighters to say, Sometimes they get a little, a little impatient. They're a little like, oh, your time is going to come. Keep putting in your work. Stay active. Keep putting in work every day. And sooner or later, your time is going to come. The problem is when they're all, you know, they, are, they give up in the sport. Yes. If you're still alive in the sport, your time is coming sooner or later. And I told Roberto, we talked to Roberto many, many times and say, hey, things are going to happen sooner or later. And he says, well, everything's going to fall in place sooner or later. And things fall in place. Just be patient. Obviously, there's the obstacles. Right now, we're going through some, a pandemic that is enabling the promotion, the fighters, the coaches to open up. And, but the opportunities are well, there. Well, Coach, it's you mentioned it. We lost the show this week. Tomorrow yeah, night. It's just a matter of time. Coach, tomorrow night, we were supposed to have a pinche chivo con un pinche pescuezo all fucking chopped up. We're supposed to have beef yet tomorrow night. Last week. I had this guy at the ranch with a knife on the on the go like this. So I called the I go, I go, quita el cuchillo. So the guy, the guy, quita el cuchillo. No lo mates, no yeah. lo mates. So the guy, the guy re, uh, released the knife, so he had to go to the chivo, the chivo, the chivo. He's happy right now. The oh, yeah. pinche chivo. Hey, he's having chivitos right now. As soon as he let him go, the chivo's jumping all over the place. You know, yeah. he's Oh, he gets, man. He gets Look at the positive. Feet. Now the Chivo is having Chivitos. So now we're going to have more Chivos. <laughs> but I will tell you this. September, I'm working my ass off. Marlene. October, Franchon. November, Sulem. December, Senicia. Every month, I want a woman fighting on a cart. Right. Because it's coming up. And sooner or later, they're going to mix and fight each other. Hey. Uh, you who, know what? Who, I, keep, who stays on the top will fight each other. Roberto, I love hearing that because that means that's, that's a beautiful part of the sport. You that, know, the best fight the best. Uh, how, how about the best interview by the best? So, uh, the best part is when I interview Salem after a fight. Hopefully, I'm working for the zone that night. She's like, I want to thank Thurs Diaz, Roberto, and Joel Diaz. Don't say thank you to Beto because I'm not involved with it. All right. So Thursday, imagine this: Thursday is host interviewing a Thursday is viewer. Oh man! By the way, Sulem has probably the baddest outfit coming out for the next fight that I've ever seen. Okay, oh, last. Stay tuned. Stay tuned. Oh, uh, we will get going. Beto Gomez, thanks so much. We will get going with you if you guys want to uh, check out a podcast I did the other day with Gustavo Ariano for the LA Times. It's about the 50th anniversary of the Chicano Moratorium. It's on the same YouTube page. It's also on my uh, Instagram, YouTube, uh, iTunes. It's about uh, the death of Ruben Salazar and everything else in LA Times um, features that they did over the weekend. So if you guys want to learn about the Chicano Moratorium 50th anniversary, go and check that out. Rate, review, subscribe, hit the bell. But without a doubt, El Pinche Chivo lives another day, as Eric P. says. But we will. Two, three weeks. But we're going to get that Pinche Chivo. Coach, I was ready to have tomorrow. I had it all planned. A pajarete. I was ready to go take a nap. Chivo. And then El Chivo in the noche. I was going to fall in your po- sleep in your pool like Will Wright. I was going to get fucking hammered. I had all kinds <laughs> of plans. Right. Yeah. <laughs> I, ha- I had plans. I was going to wake up next to your bulldog in the morning. Oh, I had all- And then go golf with Tonyo. I had it all planned. But hey, pandemic hit us. No problem. So we will take care of it. But next Thursday we will do. Hold on. Let me, hold on. Let me make sure my schedule is right. Yeah. Uh, yeah, next Thursday we'll do Thursday is here. We don't have to quarantine until Saturday, Coach. So we will see you for the Thompson Show next weekend. But next Thursday we'll do another edition of Thursday is. Razo isn't available, so we don't want him. Uh, coach, thank you so much. Roberto Diaz, glad you're back. As always, 
Uh, you have the decanter where everybody's all having a good time. So thanks for everybody. Lorenzo, any last words? Yes. Shout out to Gustavito, young kid that had a transplant in Arizona. I hope you're doing be- very good, hijo. Keep oh, fighting. Wow. You're a fighter. Vamos. Para adelante. Wow. Coach, any last words? I want to I wanna say, I want to uh, do a shout out to Mrs. Rocha from Blythe. She always, she's always supporting the, yeah, the, uh, the podcast, job. Mrs. Rocha. Yep. She has surgery. She has surgery here in Indio. They were here for surgery, her and her husband, Mr. Rocha. Mr. Ochoa, I mean, Mr. Ochoa, Mrs. Ochoa. Yeah. Um, and uh, when they were here, I knew they were here for, uh, she, she got surgery. And I was always, you know, communicating with him. Anything he needed, the surgery was, was, was a success. She's out. God bless her. Uh, she's she's good now. She's watching the show. As a matter of fact, right now, I want to shout out to my friend Nono in Fresno. Danny Zamora, I always watching. Oh, she Danny Zamora's Danny. watching? Ah, all right, all right. But here's the thing, though. A lot of people comment, but they don't tell us that they're watching. So while, if you're watching, like, let us know. Send us a text. We'll shout you guys out. A Garden Angel, great show as always. Cesar Campos does a great job with the cuts. Hector from uh, TKO Boxing in Orange County in Santana. Uh, Alexis Rocha and Ronnie Reels, shout out to them. And, uh, you know, let me put this on me right now at the very end so I can cut this out. Um, special shout out, shout out to our friend Albert Baker from Under the Hand Wraps. Uh, he lost his father uh, not too long ago. He buried his father today. Albert Baker does a great job. He and his wife, Lena Amazing Baker. videos. Amazing, Amazing videos. Amazing. They're yeah. great people. So, Albert, uh, you're a, a great man. You're a good friend. And thank you so much. Uh, for just being a good friend, not just for boxing, but just as a person. And uh, our uh, deepest condolences to you on the loss of your father. Uh, and uh, Albert, you uh, wore your uh, military uniform with uh, it, with great honor because Albert, I'm going to say this now, damn, you look sexy, bro. I mean, you had your military <laughs> uniform on. If you've seen, because we, we're so used to seeing Albert in his size uh, medium t-shirts and his arms all big. Medium. But when he puts on his military uniform, Albert, bro, se mira bien, pipiri wow. You know, here we go. <laughs> so, Albert, we love you my guys. My condolences, yeah. brother. My condolences. You do an amazing job, man. Yeah. It's beautiful, your videos. Yeah, we'll, we'll take care of that. So, for everybody else, we'll see you guys next week. Another edition of Thursday is coming your way. Marco Favela in Las Vegas, thank you so much. Uh, when is boxing coming up? We don't know. But whatever, without a doubt, Thursday is every Thursday. Rate, review, like, and we'll see you next week. Adios, everybody. And, and while you're at it. Buenas noches. Buenas noches, papá. Te quiero. Hey, hey you, know, take Thanks, a, you, you know what? Wait, you know what? Hold on, hold on, hold on, hold on, hold on, hold on. Hold on, hold on, hold on, hold on. Before I say goodbye. Uno más? Uno más? I'm, I'm, well, I'm, you know what? Fuck it. What am I American, doing? American what? American women. No, no, sorry. What? American what? American gay or something like that. Yeah, yeah, something uh, like that. Uh, Come know. on, Beto. It's for you. American what? Uh, What's the name of the tequila? What's the name of the tequila, Beto? Sepa la American agave, uh, but then... Uh, American, American agave. woman. But, look, 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 American. Hey, McKenna's asleep already. Ah, bueno. You have to tune it. Woo! Buenas noches, everybody. Adios. Good night. Love you guys.